Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today, we will be continuing our coverage of the Chris Watts case by going over his first formal police interview. This is the third in our ongoing series, and as such, I would strongly urge you to go watch our previous two before this one, as we will be expanding on those episodes with the understanding that our viewers have seen that coverage. A link to those videos will be left below, along with a playlist to make the viewing easier. If you're already familiar with the case, you likely won't need to watch those videos though. The footage that we'll be covering today comes to us from the channel Riddled, which will be left down below as well. With all of that said, let us begin. This video is brought to you in part by Beam. I've been pretty open about my issues with falling and staying asleep on this channel. One of the main reasons my brother and I are able to be so productive when it comes to content creation is because for years, I would only be able to sleep for a short, inconsistent burst of hours, between two and four hours. Initially, when I began this channel, that got worse. Obviously, the subject matter isn't the most relaxing, and I found that the stress was keeping me awake for longer. But I've been able to sleep a lot better thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Beam Dream. Beam is a nightly cocoa-like drink that's blend of magnesium, melatonin, and reishi mushroom extract helps me get a more restful night's sleep. After years of only being able to sleep at most four hours, I slept eight last week, which is a massive deal for me. They have multiple different blends and flavors for you to try, so if your system doesn't agree with melatonin or you don't want to use a product with hemp, they still have options for you. And the flavors are all amazing. After I first began using them, I bought some of their other flavors to test on my own, and my current favorite is the Chocolate Peanut Butter Dream Powder. Dream is only 15 calories, gluten-free, vegan, non-GMO, and is keto-friendly. I also found that if you do intermittent fasting, it doesn't spike your blood sugar at the end of the night, so you won't be breaking your fast when you drink it. I've personally seen the benefits of using this product, and I can't recommend it more. If you have issues falling and staying asleep, you have to try Beam. In a clinical study, 93% of participants reported Dream helped them get a better night's sleep and wake up feeling more refreshed. Click the link below and to get up to 40% off. At the end of our last video, we watched as Chris tried his best to manipulate the public in his press interviews. When he was asked to go in front of the world and plead for his family's return, he believed that he put on the performance of a lifetime, but the opposite was true. These interviews quickly drew the public's ire, as it was clear that he knew more than he was saying. That same day, he was finally brought in for his first police interview. Before Chris even enters the interrogation room, the interrogator apologizes that they can't conduct the interview in his office. This of course is a lie. No one wants to be in an interrogation room, and most people try to avoid it if they can. Being stuck inside a windowless, sterile room with no source of stimulation besides an officer who is actively trying to place as much stress on you as they can is not the majority of people's idea of a good time especially when you annihilated your entire family less than 24 hours before. Chris is already under a certain amount of stress, because he just killed his entire family and is now trying to get away with it. Should the interrogation start on a negative foot, with him being accused of murder out of the gate, Chris will probably shut down, end the conversation, and ask for legal counsel. Instead, they attempt to put him at ease. He's not being talked to as a suspect, although he is. They are simply talking to him because they need his help. And, wouldn't you know it, they were going to have the conversation in his office, but it was too messy. By apologizing for putting Chris in this sterile environment, they are hoping to establish a friendly connection, to make him feel as though he's being believed by the investigators, and that suspicion is not on him. Let's see if that works. Probably, you know. Yep. Do, you, do you have a preference? It doesn't matter. Okay. I'm going to go make a copy of this so we can look at it together. Sure. You got on water and food and all that? I'm not going on water, right? I'm good. You hungry? Well? I'm fine right now. Thank you, though. Right. As of right now, Chris is not displaying any signs of stress. In prior footage, he has displayed a habit of rocking back and forth and raising his hands over his head, licking his lips, and blinking at a rapid rate whenever he gets the feeling that suspicion is falling on him. 
so him casually sitting down in this interrogation room and hopping onto his phone is notable. In our last video, we discussed how even though Chris was an awful liar, he didn't seem to be aware of that. He seems to believe that he is an extremely gifted manipulator and can make the facts of the case fit his own narrative. Take, for example, the home being locked when the police arrived. While being interviewed by the press, he changed key details to state that the garage door wasn't locked at all. In fact, according to the security on the house, it was completely unlocked and partially ajar. He made sure to publicize that, with the hope that the public would believe that Shanann had exited out of the garage with the girls in order to spite Chris, who had just told her he planned on leaving her. And Chris isn't technically wrong. According to the security log on the home, the garage door was ajar. But, as Chris admitted on the body cam footage, the sensor for that door doesn't work. Additionally, Nicole, Officer Coonrod, and her son all witnessed the door being locked. It's on camera. And Chris himself acknowledged that the security system was wrong. However, he did that before he was made aware of the security camera footage. Now that he needs to provide an alternative theory as to what happened, he trusts the security system. The door had to have been ajar. Nicole waited outside for no reason. His claims don't hold up to even the slightest bit of pushback. But he's going to continue making them because in his mind, he believes he can convince people that what he is saying is true. Earlier, the interrogator asked Chris if he would rather have the door opened or closed, which, again, was a way to establish that this was not a formal interrogation. Chris wouldn't expect an officer who believes that he murdered his wife to care about his feelings, so when he does, it makes him think that he's being believed. Additionally, the interrogator keeps the door open, which would amplify that feeling. Despite their interview taking place in an interrogation room, the interviewer is going through pains to establish that this is incredibly informal. So what I want to do is, we have a whole bunch of people coming in, you know, from your neighborhood. Somebody saw something, somebody knows where these kids are. And I keep saying, kids, I'm sorry, you kids in your wife. That's, that's, um, I and I should say, um, I work these quite a bit, and so tonight, if I make one of those mistakes, when I say kids instead of your wife and kids, I apologize. It's, we work it a lot, and so I apologize if something comes out wrong, or, um, anyway. So, I know you're going through a lot, so I'm not going to keep you here all night. Can we go through this? Yep. So, uh, okay, let's see, you're 148, North Hall Detective Visitor. What does that mean? He knows what that means, and his entire apology about him potentially not referring to Shanann and the girls correctly is, you guessed it, another way to establish a sense of affability to the conversation. His actions indicate to Chris that he maybe doesn't know what he's doing. He works cases like this all the time, and so he can't keep a lot of the details straight. More importantly, he doesn't even know about the ring doorbell footage, something Chris has gone over countless times at this point. When someone believes they're the most clever person in the room, they tend to make incredibly stupid mistakes. Let's see if that's the case here. So the doorbell has a, uh, a camera on it when you get up to a certain proximity, and when you ring it, it detects a visitor. Okay. Oh. Pausing once more, we weren't distracting him. The door needs to be closed, so as time goes on and the interviewer begins to apply more pressure, Chris will begin to feel as if he cannot leave. Leaving the door open was simply done to gain trust, and he cleverly finds ways to close it while not breaking said trust. Um, so in fact, you know, why don't let's do this. Um, so I work a lot of stuff like this in bank robberies, and when I talk to, uh, you know, a witness at a bank robbery, sometimes I find it best for them to just say, uh, I just say, uh, tell me what happened, get it all out, and then once you get it out, let's go over it, okay? So just get it all out as far as this. Tell me exactly what you remember, and I'll take notes about where we can go. Interrogation is not a precise science. There are multiple schools of thought when it comes to what is a good interrogation technique. 
The one being employed here stems from the general belief that when a guilty party tries to appear innocent, they will over-explain the situation and add unimportant details. However, this isn't always the case, and it's far from a direct indicator of guilt. Okay. So, this 1.48 a.m., let me switch chairs. Okay. Yeah, that's when they come knocking. In a very short span of time, the interrogator has completely changed the energy in the room. This interrogation started completely informally, with him apologizing for having to use such an official room, leaving the door wide open and having Chris sit in the chair closest to the door. But now, he has managed to close the door and switch seats with Chris effectively blocking him from the exit. Once more, when he begins to apply some pressure onto Chris, this change will be incredibly anxiety-inducing. Alright, so 1.40 a.m., doorbell, detects the visitor. So when we were um, over at the neighbor's house, that, the next day we were looking at his camera as well, and it didn't show anybody walking up to the driveway, which is kind of weird, that's the only reason I put that on there, because it showed Nicole dropping her off, but nobody actually walking up to the house. It was kind of weird. But she was in the house. Okay. Chris tries to add to the fact in order to imply that the camera is unreliable and to assert that it's possible that the camera could have missed her exiting from the front door. This would be impossible as the front door was latched with a deadbolt. And, so, and what time are we talking? This is still 1.48. Okay. okay so, cool. uh, 2 a.m., Shannon gets into bed with me. 4 a.m., that's when my alarm goes off for work, and I'm to get dressed, brush my teeth, everything I do upstairs. Okay. About 4.15, that's when I get back, slide right into bed next to her, and start having a conversation with her about having the house, putting the house up for sale, and talking about it, like actually going, proceeding with the separation. Okay. And obviously it gets pretty emotional, like we're talking about, you know, like we felt this, the disconnection was there, like falling out of love and trying to stay together, maybe just for the kids' sake, but realizing that doing like our homework, it's not, most of the time that's not going to work. Yeah. And it gets pretty emotional because we have two beautiful kids and we have one on the way. So it's just a matter of like, it was very emotional, we were both crying, and at the end, we just said, you know, she said she was going to take the kids to her friend's house for the day, and she would be back. Okay. And I was like, okay. Let's, for a moment, pretend what he is saying is true. The last time he saw his wife, who is now missing, they had an emotional conversation about how their marriage was no longer working. They were both crying throughout the discussion, and then she left with the kids, and has not been seen since. That discussion would have happened a bit more than 24 hours ago, and he has absolutely no emotional reaction while recounting that. That doesn't align with his story. If he is a deeply emotional person, one who was crying the day before when talking about ending his marriage, his lack of emotion when talking about his family being missing is at the very least strange. Why was he more emotional about that but not this? His emotions don't even have to necessarily be sadness towards Shanann, as he keeps trying to insinuate that she stole their children. If he was angry, frustrated, and passionate about what was going on, how Shanann was endangering his children, just to get back at him, that would align with what he is saying now. But it doesn't. Chris has been cold and aloof this entire time, discussing his family's disappearance as if he lost his keys. And I went downstairs, made my protein shake, you know, the... 5 a.m., that's when I did that. Mm -hmm. Pipe my lunchbox, have my oatmeal, chicken, fill my water jug up. 5.15, I went outside, back my truck up and loaded up. Have my book bag, my lunchbox, computer, water jug, my big, big clear container. I put big clear containers in my truck so it's easy just to pull out, pull in, just depending on what I'm going to use. My o ring kit, and I knew I was going to do some stuffing box rubbers that day, so. I got some various open wrenches from my toolbox that I know those would work better than the ones they would give me. Okay. Um, 5.30, that's when I went to work. Okay. And I hadn't heard from Shanann for, to, for about two hours there, so at 7.40 I texted her and asked her if she could tell me where the kids were if she took them anywhere. Okay. Nothing. Okay. At 12, I texted her again call me. Nothing. And then about 12, 10 p.m., that's when my doorbell visitor, it read another visitor, and I was like, it, it popped up on my phone, and it says it was Nicole. 
and I try to put it on the, my phone to see if, she, if like she's just trying to get in or whatnot. And I hear her, like she's on the phone trying to. I could t I could hear her all through my phone saying she's trying to get this and then, so that's when I called her. Yeah, I called her at 12:20. See what was going on. She told me that Shannon hadn't responded to any of her calls all day or any of her friends' calls all day. Okay. And that's that's kind of that's very strange, mm -hmm. just because. I mean, if she doesn't get back to me. That that's fine. You know, like yeah. she gets busy with the kids or whatever. Yeah. So if she doesn't get back to her people, like the people like she works with direct direct sales. Okay. So if she doesn't get back with them, that's strange. Is she the type to answer the phone? For them, yeah, okay. like all the time. Okay. Yeah, it, for me, it's just like, hey, wait, <laughs> I'll see you later. Okay. Um, so about 12.40, uh, a few more efforts from the cold reacher while she's there, like outside the house. Mm -hmm. And at 1 o'clock, that's when I left, and I was like, all right, I'm on my way down there. Uh, 2 o'clock when I got home, because uh, they, they couldn't get in because the front door had a top latch to keep the kids in. Okay. Uh, Nicole and the police officer that was there. Okay. Oh, oh, right. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so they couldn't get in because the top latch of the car, I mean, top latch on the front door was hinged, and the keypad on the outside did not work to get in the garage. So they had to wait till I got there so I could get the remote open. Okay. This goes against what he said in his interview with the press, where he attempted to claim that the garage door was left ajar. So that's when I got home. I opened the garage door and we went inside the house and looked everywhere, Shanann, Bella, and Celeste, nowhere to be found. Shanann's wedding ring's on her nightstand, her phone's still on the couch, her purse is still there, the medicine for the kids is still there, the car and the car seat is still there, and there's no sign of them anywhere. Okay. Uh, three o'clock, um, the police officer, detective, uh, Bob Howard, right? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, uh, I'm uh, butcher's name every <laughs> time. I'm um, asking Nicole and I you know, questions about where she could have gone okay. or who she could be with. Um, at about 4 o'clock, the police officer that was there, he was checking the neighbor security footage. Um, at 5 p.m., uh, the same, same police officer, detective, and then sergeant, another officer, they showed up and they searched the house again. Um, about 6 o'clock, being called around to anyone that I could... That, that may know something called hospitals and hotels. Uh, 7.30 is my friend Nick and Men showed up to show support and from then on it's his friends just showing up. Uh, okay. Shows Lauren and Dave, Jeremy and 10 o'clock is pretty much about laid down but I didn't go to bed until probably like 2 a.m. just because I was fielding texts and calls all night. Okay. And I was just hoping that, I'm gonna let all the lights on in the house, I was just hoping that I'd get a knock on the door. But yeah, nothing back. happened. Yeah, but nothing happened. What do you think happened? At first, I really thought maybe she was just at somebody's house, just yeah. decompressing. Just pulling off steam. Yeah. But after today, like with the onslaught of all the cars, I mean all the police cars, all the news, all the canine units, it's making me lean the other direction about someone took her. Okay. But it's just, if someone took her, it would have to have been someone she knew. Because there's uh, there's no sign of anything like being disturbed, broken. Mm -hmm. But like that's the way I'm leaning now. At first, I thought for real she was just decompressing somewhere. Just, I mean, I thought she was safe, mm -hmm. even though everything in the house was left there. But now it's just after the day with the news crews and everything, it's just it feels more the other direction, and it's freaking me out. Because I have no idea where where they are. If you could think of anything that we could do to find them, what would it be? I mean, everything that I've exhausted so far is like people that have car seats, because she left the car seats. And she would never just, I mean, I mean Bella could sit in a, in a regular booster chair that because she's about that time. Mm -hmm. Celeste isn't, isn't quite there yet, but all the people that I know that have cars, I mean, they've contacted me. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless it's, I mean, there's there's definitely a chance there's somebody I don't know. Of being a guy or a girl, I, I mean, and she has plenty of friends through like direct sales that I, I've never met that could have a kid, could have a kid that she they, they come and just say, hey, you know, let's go, like just back up in the back, put them in, let's go. But thinking logically, if Shanann had done that there would be evidence of it. She had left her phone, which was attached to her social media, and there was no sign that she had contacted anyone 
Chris knows this because he had access to her phone. He also knows this because he killed her. His theorized version of events makes no sense, but it's all he has when it comes to shifting the focus off of himself. Moreover, the interviewer asked Chris if he could think of anything that the police could do to find Shanann, Bella, and Celeste, what it would be, and Chris doesn't actually answer the question. He begins to talk about how he contacted everyone he knows, but goes on to say that it's possible whoever picked them up is someone he doesn't know, once again implying that Shanann could have been cheating or leading a double life. But I wouldn't have a name, I wouldn't know who they are. Okay. And this is like, that's what's driving me nuts. It's like, when I saw the news, it was like, if she's out there, it's like, just come home. Like, who would, if, if someone has her, or like, not just has her, but she's at somebody's house and she's just decompressing, it's, it's time to come back. Because now it, this is real. Okay. This has gone to a different level. Absolutely. Okay. Um, do you have an inkling of if it's good or bad? Yesterday, I, I would have thought that she was safe and she was, it was good that she would been that she would come home. Today, it's more on the other side because I don't think that she would let it get this far if she was just decompressing somewhere. I mean, she's not talking to anybody. As far as I mean, and, and people that have reached out to me that I haven't talked to in like a year mm -hmm. that are friends with her. Mm -hmm. Like one of her like best friends, Mark Judy, lives in Florida. She works in the police department down in Miami, mm -hmm. and she called me today. Like that's one of her friends she would confide in. Oh, okay. So and and she hasn't heard nothing, anything. Nothing. And nobody's heard anything. Mm -hmm. Her okay. parents. I mean, she doesn't like talking to her mom, but still, she would. Her mom calls her enough that she would at least answer once. Yeah. There was no reason for Chris to think that Shanann was decompressing and taking time for herself. In fact, even though he pitches the idea. He never provides any examples of Shanann doing anything like this in the past, because he can't. Shanann had never gone off the grid in the time he had known her. She was extremely extroverted and talked to the majority of her friends on a daily basis. Her being without her phone was considered a definite sign that something was very wrong, yet Chris tried to pass it off as a non-event. Had Shanann been known to take long car rides without her phone, going off for hours to get her mind right, the people closest to her would know that. But she never did that. Had Shanann really run off with the girls, Chris would have immediately taken her abandoned phone as a sign something was desperately wrong and jumped into action. And if she's, I mean, I'm married, I know how it is. If she's hacked off at her husband, would she call her mom? She would call one of the friends that uh, contacted me. Okay. Uh, at least one of them, because she has, she has a close-knit group. Okay. But the fact that none of them know anything this is very strange because one of them would have said something by now, seeing what this is escalated to. Is it possible that her close knit group isn't close with you and there is somebody who knows where she is right now? I don't think so because, I mean, Nicole is a very, she's very close with Nicole. And the way Nicole is acting right now, as far as how emotional she is, there's no way, like, she knows. What does that mean? There's no way, like, she would know, like, where she is if she knew. Oh, so you're saying. If Nicole knew. Yeah, Nicole knew, like, the way she's acting right now, she's, she's as freaked out as I am. Okay. No, she's as freaked out as you are pretending you are, and not pretending well, mind you. Nicole has truly spearheaded the charge to find out where Shanann and the girls are, and without her, this case would not have unfolded the way that it had. So there's no way, like, she would know where she is if she knew. Do you, know, do you know Nicole that well? I'm decent. She's been over at my our house a good amount of time. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so, and you've obviously spoken with Nicole. Oh yeah. And you don't have any weird feelings from her. No, she was she was there at the at the house. Was okay. Like she was she was the one that was ringing the doorbell trying to see what was going on. Okay. Um, do you have a sense that the police here, or the FBI here, do you have a sense that we have a good enough list of people to call and check with? So I, don't, I think so because I've I've gone through my entire phone. I know Nicole's gone through her entire phone. Amanda, anybody that lives here that knows Shanann. Mm -hmm. They pretty much have the same contact list. Okay. So if there's somebody that's not on that on my phone, it's on theirs. Okay. Has somebody? Uh, I think the police have Nicole's phone. Or I'm sorry, your wife's phone, right? Yes. And I don't want to pronounce her name wrong. Shanann. 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 Yep. Okay. So the police have Shanann's phone. Yep. Do they have your phones? Have they looked at your phones? I don't think so. Okay. Can I run that out and have them look real quick? Yeah. Okay. Is there any password I'm going to run into? Uh, three three zero. 3307? 3387. 3387. Are there any other phones we can check? 
Mm-hmm. Okay. When they look at this, what's the best thing that they can do to, I don't know, to say, um, look for these contacts, look for this uh, Instagram, look for this Snapchat. You so know? like the only thing on here that I would say it's going to be weird because our contact list is the same. Oh, you guys have a shared contact yeah, like list? Every Google. Yeah, it's like, yeah. it's like, I've, like all the, yeah. what drove me nuts is that when she like downloaded to the cloud, it multiplied or duplicated, duplicated, duplicated. Oh, I hate that. I hate that. Yeah, so this is the same person over and over again. Ten people over. Oh, okay. So we have the same contact. Okay. List. So I'm going to run this out. Okay. Um, so 3387. And I really want them to just not physically rip this phone apart, but really dive in. Okay. okay. And is that, are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'll just, I'm going to hand this off to somebody. Okay. All right. Chris, in his efforts to not look guilty, has fucked himself here. Chris wants to appear as if he has nothing to hide, but he hasn't been honest with the police. He has not told them that he's been carrying out an affair with a co-worker, and that she was the true cause of the split in his marriage. He erroneously believes that if he continues to push the police towards believing that Shanann had taken the girls out of spite, he will never have to account for that fact. The police will just take a cursory glance at his phone and move along, but he's the main and only suspect. The way he has moved since his family's disappearance has been more than suspicious, and he has just provided to the police a motive. As we mentioned in our previous videos, Chris had an app on his phone that was disguised to look like a calculator, but was really an app that hid multiple illicit photos of his younger girlfriend. The moment the contents of his phone were examined, those photos were found, and the reasoning behind his family's disappearance became clear. Chris could have denied giving them access to his phone, or better yet, could have informed the police that he was carrying out an affair and there was proof on his phone of that. But instead, he hands them the phone, believing either way they aren't going to look through it, or that the secret app that he's using looks so real that they won't check it. So, you know, strap on your CSI hat. Uh, you can imagine the FBI has some pretty cool tricks and toys and everything. Is there anything you can think of that we should be doing that we're not? Honestly, everything that I saw that it was like, it was, it took me on a whirlwind. I didn't think all that was going to happen. So, that everything that happened today, I thought you guys were like spot on. Okay. Um, is there anything that a friend has said? Oh, has the FBI done this? Has a, well, you probably didn't know the FBI was involved until no. an hour ago. Yeah. Um, is there any good ideas that your friends have had saying, man, they got to try this, they got to do this? A lot of people have asked about Amber Alerts, but I'm not sure, like, why that. I'm not sure, like, I'm sure, you know, Amber Alerts have to do with, like, all right, if you know someone has taken a kid, but since right. the last person you saw was with the mom, yeah. and you'll think hey, everybody's gone. Yeah. That's probably why the Amber Alert's not really yeah. used in this respect. Well, they did a, they did a press statement. So, um, Amber Alerts are a little bit different. Um, one thing that helps Amber, Alert, Amber Alerts is cars. You know, when mm-hmm. you're driving down the freeway and you say, a missing person, look for this car. What car do we look for? And that's the only car she has is the one that left in the garage. The Lexus? Mm-hmm. And that's what you drove here tonight? Yep. Okay. Do you have any other cars that you drive? I just my work truck. Okay. Um, Lexus. Does the, le- oh, the Lexus is here. Okay. How could she have left the house? This is the question Chris had prepared for when he first saw the footage of him pulling his car into the garage. His neighbor's camera was motion activated, so it caught the front of the home from the garage, and was so sensitive that it caught cars approaching from up the street, and regularly caught the girls going in and out of the front door. And, as we know, all of the doors on the house were locked from the inside, with the only accessible point of entry being the garage door, which only Chris could gain access to via his truck. By locking the home up the way that he had, Chris left himself very few options in terms of how he could claim Shanann had left the home. She could not have left via the front door, as the latch had been locked from the inside. She couldn't have left from the side garage door or the sliding glass back door, as they were also locked, and they could only be locked from the inside. Had Chris known that his car would be caught on the security footage, he would have properly left the door unlocked to make it look like she had left of her own accord. He has tried to give multiple ways she could have left the house since realizing that the security camera footage existed. The first theory he gave was that Shanann had taken the girls out via the side garage door, which he claimed she left ajar. 
and walked them to a car, waiting for them behind the home where there aren't any security cameras. He then said it was possible that they couldn't have left via the front door and been missing on the neighbor's camera because that had happened before. Let's see what he comes up with now. Only way she could have left the house is if somebody picked her up, but it would have to have been from the back. Because if the camera in the front where the neighbor, the way it faces the driveway, it would have picked that up. Only thing it picked up was me leaving at like 526. Okay. How do you know? Is it your camera? It's neighbor's camera. Oh, did he tell you? Yeah, we, all, we were all over there watching it with okay. the officer. Okay. All right. It just showed me loading up my truck. Oh. Um, is it on all the time? His camera's on all the time, yep. Okay. And all it saw was you leaving? Yep. Did it one. show her coming home? I didn't show her walking in, no. Okay. But she, she was in the house when yeah, I Yeah, obviously. So I, I'm, I was just like a... I'm just trying to think. So the camera, is it possible that it doesn't catch everything? Like the motion detector? It, from what I saw, I think, like, he showed me other, like, examples, but it was picking up, like, minuscule things oh. here and there. Like, it was like, it didn't take much to, like, just get it started recording. Oh, so it probably is a motion detector then. It's yeah. It's start points. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So then there's his camera... And your security system. And my doorbell camera right and there. your doorbell camera. And the only thing that was strange about mine that morning was that when I left, it said garage door two remained open. But it didn't remain open, Chris. We have video evidence that the garage door didn't remain open. The sensor is broken, which you pointed out. Chris only began to bring up this point to try and point focus away from himself, even though, like all of his other points, it's nonsense. When you left, were you parked in the garage when you left? I pulled out and I hit the, and it said, I thought it shut. Oh, okay. And it said main garage door to open while, when I went back and looked at all the history. And Nick Nicole said that it was shut when she got there. Okay. But it said it was, because on my, on my notifications, it'll say something's left open, but it won't say when it shut. Oh, so you got a notification that was open mm -hmm. after having, after when you thought you shut it? Yep. Okay. All right. Next I looked back and I saw it shutting. Okay. Um, kids, do they have any security little watches? Mm -hmm. You know, something they have the call home button? Nothing like that? Nothing like that, yeah. No iPads? Mm -hmm. How old were they? Four and three. Oh, they're pretty young. Okay. Anything else you can think of? Honestly, like, we've exhausted, like, every option, every friend that we know okay. that could have, like, that could have helped her. Okay. Um... So we talked about her decompressing a few times. Where would she do that? She would have to go to her friend's house to do that. She wouldn't just go anywhere, not with the kids. At no, a hotel? Would. I've checked, if she, had, if she had any cash on her, I'm not sure like how much she would have had on her. She doesn't, usually doesn't carry much cash. And okay. the cash she had in her wallet was from Nicole the previous day. From who? From Nicole. Oh, okay. She told me that was the cash she gave her. I'm gonna start when we found her purse. For what? No, there was, I'm not sure if she didn't tell me. Okay. But um, that was only cash out of her wallet. And is that still at the house, you said? Yeah. Okay. So is her license in the wallet? Yeah. So she's got no cash that we know of, no license, no phone. Um, anything about the clothes in the closet, the hamper, the drawers that makes you think? She packs some boots, she's going to the mountains. Like she has so many clothes in that in that closet, like it's, it'd be hard to really tell if she took a little amount. Okay. I mean, if she took a big amount, it'd be pretty obvious. But like a little amount, it would never. Be. Okay. All right. She has like say like that whole wall, and then the bottom, and the other side. Okay. If you take this room, it's about the size of it. A woman with a lot of clothing. You don't say. No. Okay. Shoes? Anything about shoes that you think? She has a whole shoe closet. <laughs> So there's nothing obvious that screams at you. She's mm -hmm. preparing for this type of activity. Okay. Um, I have no girls, the kids close to. There was a, enough that was there that I saw missing. Okay. So, um, all right. So I know it's hard to talk about. Um, you mentioned that there was a hard conversation that the two of you had about Separation. Uh, your marriage and separation. Now that you've had a little bit of time to think, looking back on that conversation, um, can you connect the dots between both of you being upset and crying, and here we are, and now she and the kids are gone? What do you, what do you think about? I think about like 
did I cause this? Like, did I make her feel like she needed to leave? And like, did she really feel like the things she was saying? Did she really feel the same? Did she really feel like all right? The disconnection. Did she really feel all that, or she was just saying it? Like maybe like us falling out of love. Did that? Was that really registering her at that point in time, or did it register after I left to go to work? And then she's just like, you know, I'm just gonna leave. Okay. It's like I'm not sure because she laid back down. Okay. She was still there when I left. Okay. But like maybe she sat there and, and thought about it. Like, do I really need to stay here right now? Okay. Like, if he doesn't love me, maybe I should just go. Can you really get into that conversation with me? And what I want to know is. Um, you obviously have a very deep relationship with her, she's your wife, but it's going to be easy for me to listen to what it was said and maybe think that there are some clues about maybe she did just lay down and, and cry a little bit longer and something happened to her, or maybe she did get frustrated and she left. So let's, can we recreate that conversation? Mm -hmm. So tell me what happened. To be clear, everything he states from this portion forward is going to be a fabrication, meant to paint Shanann in a negative light. This is in no way close to what actually occurred. So I crawl back in bed. So sorry, let's start from, um, she gets home late at night. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll start from that point. Okay, so she got home about 2 a.m. And were you already home? Oh yeah, I was, I was passed out. Okay. Yeah, so like, I, I, could, I felt her get into bed, that was about it. But about 4 a.m., that's when my alarm, <coughs> that's when my alarm went off to go to work. Okay. That's when I got ready and everything. And so from, she gets in at 2. Alarm was off at four, okay? Mm -hmm. and, you, and you were sleeping that whole time? Oh, yeah. Okay, so the conversation hadn't started? No. Okay. Well, so about when my alarm goes off, that's when, after I get ready for work, I call back in bed and have that conversation. So you wake up at four, mm -hmm. from at four, then what, until you start the conversation? I get dressed, get my get my clothes on, brush my teeth, deodorant, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Shower? No. Okay. Shower up. Yeah, back at four. Okay, what do you do for a living? I work in the oil and gas. Okay. So then it doesn't matter if you go to work without a shower. Okay. Doesn't really matter. <laughs> All right. It's going to be bad anyways. Yeah. So then you wake up, you get ready. I'm sorry I interrupted you. You're fine. Um, so, then, so then what time are we talking about when you're ready to talk with her? About 4.15 or so. Okay. And so she was asleep from the time she got in from 2 to 4, mm -hmm. or 4.15. You wake up at 4, 4.15, you're ready. Okay, and at 4.15 you start talking. Mm hmm why do you talk at 4 15 in the morning? I felt like I needed to talk to her face to face because, okay. like, I wanted to say something. Much, um, I, I, like, when she was in Arizona, like, I didn't want to do it through a text. I didn't want to do it through a call. I was like, I got back in bed. I was like, I needed to, I needed to talk to her about this because she had told me, she had told me like when she was when she was gonna fly back that she wanted to get up with me so she could take a shower. She wanted to get there for me. What do you mean when she got back? When she flew back in. From Phoenix? Yeah. Okay. So she told you, let's have a talk? No, she wanted to get up with me so she could take a shower at the airport off her because she was like, oh. her, flight, her flight was delayed. Oh, okay. Her flight was supposed, was supposed to get in 11, but it okay. to 11. Okay. And so did she call you or did she text you? I think there was a call. Okay. On that one. All right. And so at 4.15, what happens? That's when I crawled back in bed and I, was, I woke her up. Okay. And then I proceeded to talk to her about how I was feeling about I felt like what's been going on with us for the last, what, what she's seen in like the last six weeks, because we were, she was in North Carolina, and I was down there just the last week. But from what, just being apart, and just like figuring out who people are. It's mm -hmm. like the best, honestly, like the best way for people to really find out who they are is to spend time apart. I agree. And just kind of just like, you need to see yourself. But he wasn't seeing himself. Chris tries to frame the scenario as him being on his own for the first time in eight years and realizing that he had outgrown his relationship with his wife. That when she left with the kids, he had his first taste of freedom and realized he no longer wanted to be with her. But that wasn't the case at all. He had already begun a deeply inappropriate relationship with a co-worker. And the moment Shanann left, he began a physical relationship with her, going so far as to Google when it was acceptable to tell someone you love them after a few dates. Chris, it seemed, was somewhat codependent on the women in his life, and would likely not have left Shanann if it had not been for the fact that he had another relationship waiting for him. He felt desired by Nicole, who he would later state was pursuing him, which he found refreshing, and so he felt comfortable enough to leave his wife. 
had Nicole broken up with him, or had she not been interested in the first place, Chris's big revelation that he no longer wanted to be married to Shanann would likely not have happened. Well, and then on the last week, that's when I went back to North Carolina, and I was there for the last week there. Okay. And when we were together, we could feel like it, was, it wasn't there, that spark. Mm-hmm. I know it's kind of cliche, but that spark sure. wasn't there anymore. Mm-hmm. And on that night, I told her, well, that morning, early that morning, mm-hmm. I told her, like, the disconnection, it's, it's there. Like, it's not going away. Like, the connection we had when, in the beginning, mm-hmm. it's not there anymore. It's okay. like, I don't feel like the love we have is there anymore. Okay. And it's just like, I don't feel like, I mean, if we want to stay together for the kids, I'm not sure if that's going to work. Mm-hmm. Like, bringing us what you told her? Yes. Okay. Like, Having another baby bring us in this relationship, do you think this is going to work mm. with us being together? Or separation, I think, is going to be the best possible route for us. And that's when, like, all the crying and everything proceeded. And it was just, it was very hard just, just to talk talk about that. Mm. But I needed to do it face to face. Okay. And I needed, like, I needed to see her face, like, while I did it. I couldn't like, text, phone, whatever. I needed to be face to face and be able to see her and know that she was going to be at least reciprocating back to me. Oh, what did she say? She said that it was, I mean, it was, she wants, she wanted to kind of work on it, Mm -hmm. but if that's the way I was feeling, then she respects that. In the span of less than two months, Chris went from being a loving and affectionate partner who was excited at the prospect of having their third child to telling her that he no longer felt a spark with her and that he wanted to separate, all because he was being pursued romantically by someone at work. The fact that Chris was able to emotionally cut Shanann out of his life in a matter of two months is truly alarming. He had been with her altogether for ten years, married to her for eight, but in a short amount of time, decided that he actually didn't love her at all and didn't love their children and was willing to end their lives so he could be with his new, fun girlfriend. This was a massive life change, and one that he had to come to in an incredibly short amount of time. And she said that most of the time when you have kids and you have a relationship where people, like, they don't don't love each other anymore, they fall out of love, this connection, that having kids even bringing a new baby into the the equation doesn't always work as as keeping, like, you know, the couple happy and the kids happy. It's like it almost is like better if you're right. two are mm-hmm. on a different different sides. Yeah, and you don't want to spend your whole marriage disliking each other and faking it for the kids. Yes, no, that's that's one thing. Okay. And is that accurate? I don't want well, to yeah, that, that's that's totally accurate. Okay. I mean, you, you don't want to be you don't want to be the people parading around with like a mask on when the kids are around, and then when the kids go to sleep, you just go your separate ways. Okay. Like that's what I don't want. Okay. And that's why. That's why we talk. That's why we were talking about that separation that night. Okay. And that's why, that's why I got so emotional right there. Okay. Emotional for you too. Oh yeah, I was bawling my eyes out. Okay. Again, this event happened 24 hours ago, and since it occurred, his entire family has vanished into thin air. An action he just said he believed was done by force. If he was bawling his eyes out the morning before, the fact that he is so matter of fact about it now is odd. Throughout these interviews, Chris has not shed one tear, or even attempted to sound like he's on the cusp of an emotional breakdown. He's been apathetically saying that this whole situation has been a nightmare for him, but there is nothing in his behavior that really demonstrates that it has been. We know from Shanann's vlogs that this kind of bored, monotone recounting of issues and events is just kind of how Chris is. He's always like this, quiet, mellow, and a bit boring. If he was having an extreme emotional reaction to what was going on, and he had shut down emotionally, that would have made sense. One could argue that he was having a hard time processing his thoughts and feelings, so he just shut down. But he's always like this. On Shanann's live streams, and in his own posts for Lavelle, he was always boring, stilted, and passive. But passive should never be the adjective one uses when talking about how a person is acting after their entire family goes missing. Um, So then as a result, so then... How long did that conversation last? It lasts so about 4.15 when we started. We talked about the house as well. Okay. What did you say about the house? Like, we needed to sell the house. Like, there's no way, like, we can stay in this house and have another kid Mm -hmm. and be able to just keep everything afloat. Mm -hmm. 
Once again, Chris is breadcrumbing the interviewer. He is laying the groundwork for explaining why it was that on the day his wife and kids went missing, he spoke to a real estate agent to discuss selling his home. He thought that he was simply being efficient, handling the girls' school enrollment and the home the same day he murdered them. But it's only after the fact that he was pushed in the press that he realized what he had done was extremely suspicious. He's trying to push it off by claiming that it was something that Shanann and him had discussed, directly deciding to end their marriage while sobbing in bed together, because I'm sure that going over the details about how her life was going to look after her husband had left her during her next pregnancy was exactly what Shanann wanted to talk about. This is a sort of pre-explanation of what occurred, and Chris is hoping that the officer will take it at face value, because they have already established a sort of bond. And she's like, well, where do you want to move to? I was like, well... We can move to Brighton, we can move, uh, are you familiar with the area? Kind of, yeah. Okay. So we can move to Brighton, we can move to Vermont, we can move like, you know, wherever. Mm -hmm. Somewhere that's cheaper. Okay. And she's just like, well, because she had already contacted the uh, realtor the week before through an email. Oh. To, to see like what she thought. And that's when like, I, I actually contacted Ann that day. Like a little, like, pretty much five out, eight o'clock that day. Who's Ann? The realtor. Oh, okay. Yeah, and asked her, you know, like, if we can get the ball rolling, like, to see what she thought. So you said your wife called a week before to the realtor? And emailed her. Okay, so then this conversation early in the morning wasn't a shock to either of you, it was no. a surprise. It was the next step yeah. in the long conversation you have mm -hmm. to have leading yeah. up to. Okay. Yeah, it was, this was not like a, just like, way up like a big bang theory yeah. type thing. It was just yeah. like, this was, okay. It was, it, that's why it was just an emotional conversation, sure. like, because it wasn't just like a, like, come out of nowhere left field type of thing. Like, we knew, like, something wasn't, we knew about, we want to do with the house. We knew, like, what, what's going on with it. Like, we knew something was. Okay. Shanann and Chris were considering selling their home and moving into a new one in order to make way for Nico. They had not decided to sell their home because of their marriage or because they thought they wanted to separate. Literally everything that Shanann had said to her family and friends, who she told everything to, said the opposite. She thought they could work through their issues, to forge a new path together and grow back into each other. She didn't know that Chris had already moved on from the relationship and into a new one. Is it accurate to say that then the time when you were away from each other when she was in North Carolina, the time when she was in Arizona, maybe the two of you knew that that could have been time you were talking, and so when you finally get together, it's, we can't wait another second, we're going to talk. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Okay. And tell me if wrong. No, no, you're, you're right. Okay, so then uh, the conversation starts at 4.15. You talk about each other and your marriage. You talk about the house. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and that's when the conversation ends and we're talking that's when she says she's going to take her friends or take her and her friends to a, take her and the kids to her friend's house who's who's which friend that's when she did she did not say that's so why she did say i'm taking the kids to a friend's house yeah. are you sure she said that yes you're positive yes okay that's good um now we're back to the blowing off steam yeah probability which we like right yeah that's what i like okay um so Let's, you know, if we're going to play the DVR, let's rewind five minutes. So we're at the house. You're talking about the house. You're saying this isn't going to work with the kid. We're going to sell this house. Then how do you remember what led to her talking about the kids? As far as, like, taking them to her friend's house? Yeah, like, what, what conversation did you guys have? Well, that's when I rolled out of bed, and that's when she, she pretty much, she told me, like, I'm taking the kids to a friend's house today, and I'll be back later. Are you sure she said she'll be back yes. later? On a scale of 1 to 10, how, how positive? That's a 10. A 10. Yeah, okay. So she said, I'm going to take the kids to a friend's house, but I'll be back later. Why? That, I, from what I just told her. That doesn't make sense, I, though, because you'd be at work. Why would she have to leave? That's the thing. Like, why? I'm not sure why she wanted to go somewhere. Okay. But that's what she wanted. Like, maybe she didn't want to be in that house after what we were just talking Fair about. Fair enough. You just talked about it. Yeah. It's no longer in mentally, emotionally her house then. Uh -huh. Chris's story begins to fall apart at the slightest pushback. Not because it doesn't make sense, but because Chris is a bad liar. Shanann was an extrovert, and she enjoyed being around people and had confided in plenty of friends about the marital issues that she was having. Had she actually left that morning to go to a friend's house, that wouldn't have been out of character if she wanted to talk to another party about what had happened. Of course, she would have brought her phone, purse, wallet, and car with her. But let's pretend for a moment that she was an emotional wreck that morning because of the pending separation. Chris could have stated as much, claimed that Shanann 
had already made plans, and that's why she was going out with the girls. He could have easily rebutted this line of questioning, using what he knew about his wife, but he doesn't. He concedes that her actions were strange, and that they make no sense. Okay, so let's focus on, I'm going to take the kids to my friend's house. What does that mean? Hopefully it's someone that she trusts. Hopefully it's someone that she knows pretty well, and hopefully maybe they have a kid that Bella and Celeste can play with. But you have no idea who that would be? Because we have exhausted all those information, all those people. Okay. Is that, does that surprise you? Because I don't know your wife, but maybe that's something that's in her wheelhouse. Does that surprise you that she did, did said that and did that? It doesn't surprise me that she went somewhere. Like, she said she was, it might, could have been a play date. Okay. But she was very vague in the fact that she just said she was going to a friend's house. Okay. That was not what the interviewer was implying with the question. He was asking Chris if he was surprised that Shanann could take the kids and leave for as long as she has. He was leaning into Chris's version of events, that this was an act of anger done by his wife in order to spite him. He wanted to see if Chris would use this as an opportunity to delve more into his feelings towards Shanann, and if he would reveal his actual thoughts towards his wife. Up until this point, Chris has simply stated that he fell out of love with her, that the relationship wasn't working, and he had rediscovered himself because he spent a month on his own without his family. But that's not the truth. Chris fell out of love with Shanann because a younger woman was pursuing him, and she wasn't as hard to deal with as his pregnant wife and their two kids. Shanann and him couldn't go out on regular date nights because they had to be working and taking care of Bella and Celeste. He had to be responsible for them, but when he hung out with his new girlfriend, they could have fun. They could go out drinking and partying, and he felt like he didn't have any responsibilities. The interviewer has done this countless times before, and seeing as there are very few examples of people whose marriages end as amicably as Chris has stated, and still end up in an interrogation room with him, he knows that what Chris is saying is bullshit, and he's looking to see if Chris will take the bait and tell him how he really feels. I didn't say who. Okay. That's why I text her, like, if you can tell me, like, where the kids are. What time did you text her? That was 7... 740. Okay. There's no word from her, obviously. No, no. Okay. So then we're at the, sh I'm going to take the kids, I'm going to go to a friend's house. You sure she didn't say I'm going to take them somewhere to a hotel or to mm -hmm. a... Oh, there, no. There was no positive if you said to a friend's house. Yeah. And not just someone's house, but a friend's house. Yeah, because like, if it, if it was a hotel, I would have definitely asked the question, like, why are you going to a hotel? Yeah. Okay. That, that wouldn't, that would, yeah. Where can we look? to find friends that you might not know about? Honestly, Facebook's the only place. Facebook? Because okay. that's the one she frequents. Okay. That's the only place. What's her Facebook account? Or her username? I mean, it's a Shenanawads. Just regular Shenanawads? Well, they, they have access on her phone. S-H-A-N? A-N-N. -N. A -N -N. And so, they can, I think they can log into the phone, right? I think they're in her phone, right? Oh, yeah. They okay. just got to hit the icon and it's right there. So it's right there. They can, they can they get do whatever it. they want. And they can, okay. All right. Yeah, it doesn't take much. It's always logged in. Okay. Um, doesn't she do something online? Doesn't she have an online presence or something? It's with Thrive, the direct sales business. Isn't that like her job? Yeah. So it's called what? Thrive. Yeah. Then, so from 5.30 then, what? 
That's when I, I went to work. Okay. All right. And seven forty is the next time I texted her. And why'd you text her then? I was I hadn't heard from her, and I was just seeing if she knew like where if or just seeing where she went. Texted Shanann, right? Yep. Shanann? Yep. And asked if she could tell me where she was taking the kids. Oh. Okay. So at this point, it's two hours later, and you're thinking, I wonder where she's going. Yeah. Okay. And is that text on your phone? Yes. Okay. Uh, then all the way, what happened between 7.40 and noon? No, I was, work, I was outside working. Okay. Uh, noon, Texas Shanann to call me, and that's going to be on your phone too? Okay. 12.10, doorbell visitor. That's when Nicole was at the door, at the door and it pinged on my phone. Okay. What's she doing there then? Oh, then 10 minutes later, you called Nicole to see what was going on, and she told me she couldn't get a hold of Shanann either. And that her shoes were next to whose shoes, Shanann's shoes, yep. were next to the door, and her car was in the garage next to the door, inside or outside? Inside. She could, there's like a little, like a little small rectangular window next to the oh. door. Oh, okay. I see right in there. Do you, does that mean anything to you? Does Shanann or her shoes always by the door? Yeah. Okay. So when you come in the house, does she usually come in the front door? Most of them, unless she drives in. Okay. Then she goes into the garage. Okay. But that was just from the previous night when she came in. Oh, okay. So then, let's think about this for a minute. If she comes in, drives in, with, what's your other car, Lexus? Yep. She drives in the Lexus, comes in. She comes in the garage door that way, if she drives in the garage. Yeah. But since Nicole dropped her off that previous night, she came to the front door. Oh, oh someone else is driving. The yeah. Lexus is already there. The Lexus is already there. Okay, so then that makes sense. Yeah. You, you see what we're trying to do? We're trying to be like, did she walk out or was she taken out, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so then it makes sense that her shoes are still right there. Mm -hmm. But she's obviously not wearing those shoes. Okay. All right, let's keep going. 1240, a few more efforts by Nicole to reach her. How do you know? Because that's when I was, she was still at the front door. And oh, I was, I was oh to reach her at the front door. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 1 p.m. I'm now on my way home to check on my family. Uh, is that just because you're worried with, based on the conversation yeah. with Nicole? Had the police contact you by then? No. Okay. Two, but, I arrived. I'm sorry, go ahead. But uh, Nicole says she was probably going to call the cops. Okay. All right. As a reminder, Chris had told Nicole to get off of his property multiple times by this point, each time telling her that Shanann was fine, that everything was okay, and that she was just out at a friend's house. It was only when Nicole said that she was going to call the police to check on Shanann if he didn't come home that he decided to actually come back. And even so, he pretended to leave for three hours, with the hopes that she would give up and leave. Now, so it sounds like Nicole's pretty worried. Mm -hmm. More worried than you. Well, so I, I, once, once she couldn't get anything out of her and nothing was going on in the house, I was like, all right, I gotta go home. But it sounds like Nicole was more worried. Yeah, because like, most of, like, if she doesn't text me, like, I understand that. Okay. Like, sometimes that happens. Okay. But for her not to get back to her Okay. Direct sales group. Okay. That was very unorthodox. Okay. This is one of the first confrontations of the interview, and it's mild at best. Chris has not cared about the investigation at all, and when his actions are placed next to Nicole, his apathy becomes extremely apparent. As a reminder, Nicole was calling Shanann's friends and family. She had gone to Shanann's doctor to see if she had made it to her appointment, and she was at the point of breaking into the family home to check on her friend. Meanwhile, Chris has been nonplussed about the entire ordeal, meandering around and trying to get people to believe that Shanann ran off on her own, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Chris tries to play off this accusation by saying that Shanann tended to be wishy-washy when getting back to him, and that he wasn't worried until he heard Nicole was. But we've seen him. He hasn't been worried this entire time. And you had a pretty tough morning with her. Yeah. So she's, again, decompressing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's okay that she's not texting you, maybe, but you're going to come home and check in yeah. some case. Mm -hmm. But Nicole's freaking out. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. And, and I'm I'm walking myself through this. You tell me. No, no, no. That's not what happened. No, I mean, like she, she like for her not to get back to her friends like that, like that's not normal because like she'll get like tons of text messages throughout the day from okay. direct sales. All right. Like if she doesn't get back to me, I I just assume that she's busy. Okay. I'm now on my way home to check my family to get my eyes home, open the garage door. How? I have my uh, uh, button. Okay. It's in your truck? Yeah. Okay. And get inside the house. Shanann, Bella, and Celeste. Who are Bella and Celeste? That's what my kids. Okay. Oh, are 
Yeah. Not the house. Oh, okay. Shanann's Ann's wedding ring is in on her right nice hand. hand. Her phone is on the couch. Her purse is still here. The medicine for the kids is still here. The car with the car seats are still here. There is no sign of venom anywhere. Frederick police officer and detectives are asking Nicole and I questions about where she could have gone or who she could be with. How did that go? I mean, we're trying to go through from what we could uh, what we could gather, like where she could have gone. Okay. As far as like, cause what we saw in the house it didn't really make, make sense. Okay. So that's where that's where we're just like call it, start to look through the phone and just kind of call around. And once we found the phone and Nicole knew what the passcode was, just kind of load it up and see what what transpired and obviously there was like 50 something text messages that came that like popped through. Okay. All right. Because the phone was off. Okay. What do you mean the phone was off? It was off. When you found it was off off? Off. Was the battery dead? No. Why are you making that? I have no clue. Like why was it off and why was it not with her? So this was the moment for Chris to show his acting chops and he failed. He couldn't get into a community theater production if he tried. Shanann was so attached to her phone that when she didn't text her friends and family back for less than five hours, they knew something had happened to her. Chris had been with her for 10 years. He knew her habits inside and out, and he knew that she would never willingly go somewhere without her phone. If he wanted a feigned concern for her, which he had repeatedly stated he is, he would have responded to this discovery with shock. He would recount how he found her phone as being the moment he knew something was wrong, but he doesn't. He apathetically says he had no clue what to think of it. Chris believes he's doing a great job here. The interviewer had peppered in some missteps with his questions, asking who Bella and Celeste were, and getting some information wrong, to seem like he didn't know what he was doing. Chris took this and ran with it, feeling as if he was smarter than the man across from him, therefore easier to manipulate. He believes that he is successfully convincing the interviewer into seeing things from his point of view, and that by the end of this, the police will end their investigation without finding the bodies of his family. And of course, he will be cleared of all suspicion and will be allowed to live his new life with his new girlfriend. It's weird, right? Because if you're saying that she does a ton of texting and marketing and sales and calling certain people back, okay, how would it turn off? You'd have to turn it off. Okay. Because it wasn't dead. It was like 50% or so, I think. Are you sure? Okay. And it was on the couch? Mm -hmm. What do you make of that? Oh. Usually it's not right by her nightstand. Okay. That's usually where it always is. Nightstand in the bedroom? Yeah. Okay. Anything else about that? No, that, that is weird that it's, it was sitting like on the couch cushion, like right there. Okay. So, can we back up a tiny bit? You come home, no one had been in the house? No. Okay. No one could get in the house, is that right? Yeah, unless you had a garage door. Okay. And that's how you got in? So I got in. So at this point, you get there. Are the police there at this point? Yes. So you, the police, Nicole, that's it? Her son. Her son. What's her son's name? I think it's Nick. I think it's Nick. Nick. And so you and Nicole aren't besties, per se. You and Nicole. Oh, no, like, we're, I mean, we're friends, but yeah, the, my wife and her are, are okay. really good friends. Okay. And so Nick, you don't spend much time with Nick? No. Okay. Why is Nick there? That he was just with her, with his mom. Okay. Is there anything weird about Nicole and Nick? Not that I really think of. Do you think anything about your wife not being around has anything to do with Nicole and Nick? Uh, I would hope not. <laughs> I mean, like, Nicole is one of her good friends. Okay. I don't think they could have done, like, I don't think they could have done anything, like, as far as, like, helping her get out and then being so emotional when they couldn't find her. I don't think, like, they, I don't think they could be capable of that. I go up there, shake his hand, but I'm like opening the garage door at the same time. Okay. 
and then I go through, and then they're waiting at the front door. I go and open that up, and then they come in. Oh, so they didn't go in the garage with you? Okay. Well, they, they went in the garage. They didn't come in the way I did. All right. So then they, everybody goes in. Okay, and then what? I run upstairs, and I look in the bedrooms. Okay. And because that's where she would be? Mm, that's where I, I would expect. So it's just a standard house, upstairs, bedrooms, downstairs, living area? Yep. Okay. And there's one office downstairs. Okay. And then, and so then upstairs, then what? I'm going to Bella's room, going to Celeste's room, playroom, master bedroom. I'm looking everywhere, like bathrooms, and nothing. Okay. And then? I found the night, found the wedding ring right there on the nightstand, and then... Right they, then? Yeah. Okay. Is they, that weird? She only takes it off if she covers her hair. Okay. And she had already colored her hair like the week before, so okay. I don't, that was just like probably a result of her conversation. Oh, I would think. Okay. And then Nick finds her phone on the couch. And why did he find her phone on the couch? What's he looking for there? Ah, I don't know. He was he was looking for he clues. Was, to clues. Just okay. looking, just looking around too, and just happened just like to run across it right there on the couch and the next okay. position. So he found it, it's not as though you were calling it to find it, he just found it. Yeah. Okay. Then what? Saw the, um, so we saw the officer, that we found the phone, we turned it on, Nikki gets the, puts the passcode in, because it was a four digit passcode before, and it was a six digit this one, this time, so and now like, like 013119. Yeah. She knew her friend's passcode? Yeah, I didn't, because it used to be 2385, but when she changed it to six. How did Nikki know it? Maybe she knew it over the weekend, because... I've never seen a six-digit passcode on her. Nicole didn't know Shanann's passcode. She used the knowledge she had of her friend to figure out what she would have changed it to. Nicole actually cared about Shanann and wanted to help her, unlike Chris, who seemed to rid himself of everything he had known about his wife of eight years the moment he met a woman whom he thought was more fun. Phone. Is that normal to you that Nicole might share her passcode with somebody? I wouldn't think so. Has, do you know her to have done that before? No, because only she's only told me her passcode before. Like her, I mean, her phone's her lifeline. So. Okay. Are she close with Nicole? I mean, no, she's, I mean, decently close. How long have you known each other? Probably, probably at least over a year. How did they meet? Uh, when her mom, when Shanann's mom lived here, they, uh, her Shanann's mom worked at a, she's a hairdresser, and Nikki was like one of the managers. Oh, Nicole, sorry. One of the okay. Managers. And then did she, did she get her hair done there or something by Nikki? No. Okay. I was just Shan's mom and Nicole were friends, and then Shan got Nicole into the surprise and oh, okay, went from there. All right. So now we're at finding the phone, Nicole unlocking the phone, then what? Waiting for the everything to load up and watching all the text messages pop up, phone calls, pop, missed calls pop up, and go from there. And what were they? It was just people call, asking, asking, like, are you okay? Where are you? Type things. Okay. All right. Um, okay, then what? The police officer, he looks at the phone, just kind of, he just kind of look, looks through it to see, like, if anything looks, you know, on up any of the text messages. Mm -hmm. And then um, I walk downstairs and I'm looking around down there, seeing if I see anything at all. Again, this is a strange thing to lie about, especially when he knows that Officer Coonrod, Nicole, and her son all watched him stand idly by on his phone while they did the majority of searching. But Chris is comfortable now. He has heard this investigator mix Shanann up with Nicole four different times now. He doesn't know his daughter's names, and he asked very rudimentary questions in a way that has convinced Chris that he is more intelligent. He thinks that he is the one in control of this conversation, even though he is very clearly not. Okay. And then um, I think that was at, and at four o'clock. That's when um, cause the neighbor, cause the neighbor, yeah, was the officer, I went over to the neighbor's house to see if he saw anything. And who's that? was that? I think it was the officer. It was not. It was Nicole's son. Nicole and her son are really the two people who took charge of the investigation when it first started. He just went over there. Um, and then that's when the. Uh, Neighbor called him back over to show him he um, he had some stuff from the other night. Okay. Kind of show him like whatever he had that that put motion on it. Okay. Who originally called the police? Uh, Nicole. 
Okay. And is that the time when you're telling me you're coming home and she's freaking out? She said that she told me she was going to call the police, but I thought, okay, I'm coming home. It's like, let me, let, let me look through everything. Let's see what's going on here. Chris just admitted that he came to the home to stop Nicole from calling the police. He thought that by telling the woman that he was on his way, he could buy himself some time before police got involved. But when he didn't arrive for nearly two hours, she decided to get law enforcement involved anyway. And on my way home, that's when she called me and said, the cops are here. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Frederick police officer and detectives are asking Nicole and I questions about where she could have gone, who she could be with. 4 p.m. Police check neighbor security footage and question them as well. Okay. Have we talked about that? Is that where we're, we're mm -hmm. okay. That's where we're at. Uh, anything else about that? No, I mean, it just shows Nicole dropping her off, but her not walking up, and it shows me loading my truck up at okay. about the time I told you I left. Okay. Officer, detective, and sergeant come by to search the house and ask some more questions. How'd that go? They just uh, had me sign the paperwork to search the house. Okay. And I just waited outside and let them okay. go through the house to this missing person's warrant, I guess. Sure. Okay. And did they find any other clues? Okay. Um, begin calling around to anyone I know that could know something or maybe see Shanann. Calling locals, hospitals, and hospitals as well. 7.30 p.m. Friends, Nick and Amanda come by to show support. Okay, so I know begin to... So they were just going to meet up because they're expecting mothers. Yeah, they're probably just going to just hang out yeah. and find and see each other in a while. Okay. I ain't worried about her though. Okay. Who are you worried about? Chris accidentally stepped into this kind of confrontation by claiming that he isn't worried about one of Shanann's friends. He's implying that there are some he is suspicious of. This is of course not true, as he killed her and their children himself. He now has to climb out of this hole that he's fallen into. Anybody that I know right now, like if. They have not told me anything. It's it it drives me nuts. It's driving me nuts because like there's no way like the people that I know that have kids that could have helped her if, if if she's at somebody's house right now, like they would have had to say something. But with all this going on, there's no way they could have kept their mouth shut by now. So then, who are you worried about? Honestly, like. I can't really say like if I'm worried about anybody right now as far as like any of her friends that I know. Yeah. All of them are showing like they they're deep concern about what's going on right now. Okay. And I think like with that deep concern that, that can't be faked. Okay. Obviously it can't be faked, seeing as Chris has not been able to fake that same concern. Also, his response as to who he is concerned about was top tier. He's not concerned about anyone that he knows, because they are all fine and they all cared about Shanann. And he's not really concerned about anyone, because everyone seemed above board. But he's concerned about the potential that someone he doesn't know, who Shanann knows, did something. I believe him. So then, who are you worried about? It has to be somebody I don't know, honestly. Okay. The only thing that I can think of is something, somebody I don't know. Okay. Does your gut tell you that Shanann and the kids walked out or that they were taken out? Yesterday I would have said they walked out. Today I would have said I'm only in the other direction. Okay. Friends Dave Colon, Cologne. Cologne and Jeremy, Jeremy Lindstrom come by to show support. Who are they? Dave Cologne, he when I worked for Ford, he ran an auto body shop. He actually works for Boulder County Sheriff's Department now. Oh. Okay. And Jeremy Lindstrom, I worked, he was he worked in the sales department at Ford when I was a tech, mm -hmm. and he works on the Ford dealership now. Okay. Um, and Jeremy's, Jeremy's a daughter, just watched the kids over that this past weekend too, so we know them pretty well. Oh, um, what's his daughter's name? McKenna. Okay. Was she the one watching the kids the night before? Mm hmm Okay. I saw her name in her report or something. Um, how did that go with Dave and Jeremy? Oh, good. They're just, you know, just there just to show support, just, you know, chill in the kitchen. Just two of them? Yeah, then that's me. Yeah, me and them. And Lauren and all of them had gone by then? Oh, yeah. Everybody else had gone by then. Okay. Um, when they come over to show support, um, 
what you guys talking about? I was talking just about like what could have happened. Like, do you think she, do you think she could have gone somewhere? Do you think she's actually taken? Like, what is like just random questions like that? Just and then they're just talking about just other stuff to get my to kind of get things off my head a little bit. Okay. Okay. Um, Ten o'clock. I lay in bed and proceed to take calls from friends and family the rest of the night. How did I go? And just answering, uh, um, nobody can sleep as far as East Coast, anything like, you know, Addy, Sam. Who's Addy and Sam again? Addy, uh, they're leaders and thrive. Okay. They're people that Shannon thought reaches up to. Okay. Have we talked to them? Oh, yeah. We talked to them on the phone. You have? I've talked. I, I've texted them. Okay. There, it's all on there. Okay. And so the real live communication sense, we couldn't find Shannon. Yeah, like them. Okay. Have police talked to them? I believe so. Okay. Just on the phone? Yes. Are they in North Carolina? No, they're like northeast. Northeast what? Like uh, Baltimore. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, over right. there. All right. Who else calls? See, her mom. Talked to my parents. Talked to my sister. Talked to, uh, texted with Kelly. That's another, she lives in New Jersey. Oh, who else? Jeremy, Dave. All those people. Okay. All right. Um, can we talk about something that's kind of hard to talk about? Um, so when I work investigations like this, I have to keep an open mind on everything. Okay. And part of keeping an open mind is listening to you talk about your wife and your marriage, and. The day she goes missing is the day that you guys have marital discord. Okay. So you can understand yeah. what I'm thinking about you. Yeah. What do you think about that? Uh, it makes me sleep in my stomach, honestly. Like, I know, like, I've talked to a few of my friends. It's like, you know, this does not look good on you. I'm like, I know. It's like, people that, if people knew that we were having marital issues, they're going to look at me. Especially with the way everything looks. It honestly just makes me sick to my stomach because this is something that I would never do. Well, that's a lie. But this is a more direct confrontation than anything that has taken place before it. The interviewer is pointing out the obvious. How is it that on the day your wife and kids vanish, you amicably decide to end your marriage? Chris has prepared for this confrontation a little bit, but he's still nervous when the question is asked and begins to stutter a bit. And he falls back on the only real argument that he can use. That being, he would never do something like this. This is the kind of argument you would see used by a teenager trying to convince their parents that they had been wrongfully accused of vandalism or doing drugs. It's only an effective argument when the other party knows the other party well and feels like they do have an established connection. Chris using it in this context doesn't work because come on, trust me bro, is not a rebuttal to all the evidence they have found thus far. Chris has lied throughout every interview that he's given. He has tried to push blame onto his pregnant, murdered wife, and he has tried to invalidate all the evidence that is pointed towards him, even when his arguments can be disproven through his own statements. And when he is directly confronted, the only thing he can say is, please trust me, I wouldn't hurt my wife and kids. If Chris's story was true, he probably would have argued against this accusation. He had predetermined his own alibi. He went to work directly after murdering his wife and children, and no one that came into contact with him said he seemed out of sorts. He could have relied on that, saying, I left at 5 a.m. Shanann and the girls were still at home. I didn't do this. He could have given the officer the names of some people he had been in contact with, told them all the evidence of his actions were on his phone. But he doesn't do that, because he knows that Shanann was dead when he left the home. And so, his alibi is pointless. Ever. I, I know, like, you have to look at every, every vantage point. This is something I would never do to my kids or my wife at all. I'm not sure, like, what I could do, to, like, to make people believe that. Just because if they, if they knew we were having marital discord, they would automatically look at me. But there's no, I would harm anybody in my family at all. 
Chris tries to feign some emotion here to emphasize his point, but immediately drops it after two words. Chris only wants to pretend to care when he's being confronted with his actions, and even then, he can't summon the energy to be consistent. I know we were having marital discord, and we had that conversation that morning, and then she goes, we have no idea where she is, or the kids. I promise you that not, not, I had nothing to do with any of that. Are you telling me the truth? I'm telling you the absolute truth. Why should I believe you? Because I'm a very trustworthy person, and the people that do know me, they know how I'm a calm person, I am not an argumentative person. I am a person who is never going to be abusive or physical in any kind of relationship. I would never harm my kids. I would never harm my wife. I mean, you can talk. I mean, any, you can talk to any of my friends, any of her friends. They know me. They know I'm a low key guy. That's quiet. So I'm. I'm not about confrontation. I'm not about anything that elevates to that level. I mean, you can, like, if someone like, yells at me, screams at me, I just take it and I just try to get it by the wayside and get it back to where it's a cool, like, just a cool conversation to where like none of that, none of that gets to that height. Because I am not that person. I've never been that person. When the interviewer asks why he should believe Chris, instead of going through the fact that he has an alibi, he talks about how he is a quiet, calm person who would never hurt anyone, and that they can ask any of his friends about how he's such a good guy. He emphasizes that he is incredibly low-key and would never actually abuse anyone, and that all of his friends would simply know that. But to be clear, just because a person presents themselves as an easygoing person, that doesn't mean they are like that all the time. Chris killed his wife and kids. He took their lives. We know he is lying about the fact that he would never harm them, and he was able to do that and then immediately go into work and interact with his co-workers and girlfriend as if nothing was wrong. He was entirely able to have hurt Shanann and the girls behind closed doors, and we would be none the wiser. According to the article, How an Abusive Partner's, quote, Good Behavior is Part of the Act, published on the National Domestic Violence Hotline website, abusive partners are careful not to allow the public know the kind of person they are within their relationship. Usually, the only person they allow to see the abusive side of them is the person who they are abusing. They will come across as fun, easygoing, and interesting to others. So, that if the other party were to come forward about what they are really like, they are less likely to be believed. Chris couldn't have hurt Shanann, he was so quiet. Chris killed his family, and was so emotionally detached from that action, he was able to move on with his day as if nothing had happened. It's not outside the realm of possibility that he could have hurt his children. We also know that from the neighbor's testimony, Chris was not the kind of person who would try and de-escalate arguments with Shanann in private. When speaking alone with Officer Coonrod, he described that there were multiple times he became concerned for her safety because he could hear their arguments from his own home. However, because Chris often presented himself as quiet and unassuming in public, there are a considerable amount of people who believe that, somehow, Shanann is at fault for her own murder and the murders of her children. These people will start their statements with, I'm not defending a child murderer here, and I don't think anyone deserves to be murdered, but then launch into how Shanann pushed Chris into action which is obviously truly sickening. The interviewer has begun to slowly apply more pressure onto Chris, where he had taken Chris's statements at face value before, he is now beginning to question him more, ask him why he should be believed, and remain silent when he is done answering. The silence is meant to make Chris uncomfortable, in the hopes that he will fill the silence with more information. Do. Yeah. I've never done one. I don't know like what it involves, but okay. you know where it is. 
Uh, from what I've seen, it goes on your finger. Do you know what the purpose of one is? That's for a lie detector test. Okay. Um, all right. Well, why don't we do this? Let's take a little break. I'm going to come back in here because I have a lot more questions for you. Okay. Um, I want to remind you that tonight is voluntary. Okay. I can't keep you in here. I won't keep you in here. If you want to get right up and walk out of here, you can do that, okay? All right. Do you want to keep talking with me? I mean, I can. Okay. I mean, if that's what you want, I can keep talking. Okay. And you understand that I'm not arresting you right now. You understand that you can walk out of here at any time. Okay. Okay. Having said that, I do want to talk to you. Uh, I have a lot more questions for you. Do you know where your wife is? I don't know where my wife is. Are you telling me the truth? I'm telling you the absolute truth. Okay. Let's take a tiny break. Um, get some water. Do you need to use the restroom? All right, no. Okay. There's some water or Gatorade, actually, if you need it. Um, I'm going to step out for a minute. I need to look over some of my notes. Uh, I'm going to come right back in here. I'm not going to be out very long, okay? Okay. All right, I'll be right back. That was a lie. The interviewer would leave the room for nearly 20 minutes. Chris had handed over his phone to them, meaning he would be without outside stimulation the entire time he was gone, and would be poring over the previous hour and a half conversation. Leaving Chris alone like this, directly after the interviewer had begun to confront him, was purposeful. If they had taken a break prior, Chris would have been on cloud nine, believing this idiot investigator didn't even know his wife's name, and he'd be getting away with murdering his entire family. But now, Chris is terrified. Why had the interviewer's tone changed so drastically? Had they found the hidden app on his phone? Was he still being believed? His mind would be racing. By the time the interviewer would return, nearly 20 minutes later, Chris would be in a proper state of panic. have everyone else. Um, I'm just going to keep this room for a little bit longer. So just shuffle people through the other rooms. Alright. How are you feeling? Looking at that picture. Those shoes, even though they were winter shoes. They were what? Winter shoes. 
<laughs> Those are her boots, aren't they? Shenanigans got to sell them off to uh, like that Facebook marketplace. Mm -hmm. She had them on the, on the window seal there. And when we got back to North Carolina, the SEC saw them sitting over there. And she proceeded to take them back and wear them every day since they got back. <laughs> No matter if it was 100 degrees outside or what, she loved those shoes. She always loved those shoes. And Bella, she always wore some flip flops. She always will. She's just like, she loved that dress. She loved those flip flops. She, she loved that dress. She likes the buttons on the back. Starting the interview with Chris, looking at a picture of his daughters, is purposeful. They are looking for Chris to open up more, to show some emotion towards his missing wife and children, and so far, he hasn't. Even now, where he is given a small insight into his home life, he is fairly unaffected and stilted. He doesn't shed a tear or seem upset that it's been over 24 hours since his kids went missing. From the moment he killed his children, he stopped caring about them. It's incredibly haunting to observe. Is CC short or something? Celeste. Celeste. Bella Celeste. Mm -hmm. Tell me about B and C. Celeste, she's rampage. She's always the one that's she's gung ho. She's always the one that's just like she's off. She's either go or sleep. She's always the one growling. She's she's always been she's a tiger. Bella, she's the calm, the mothering one. She's the one that's always you okay? You okay? You fine? She's just, she's just the sweetest little girl. She's the one that favors me more, and Celeste is the one that favors Sinan more. And the way I look at it, you see some baby pictures of me, and Bella is just like, boom, she, the other way around. For so when you say favorite, do you mean look like? Yes. Oh, okay. Are they both daddy's girl? That one is. Hey, yeah, that's how it works, isn't it? Because the first one, I wasn't really good at it yet. It's like when I knew what I was doing and she bonded with me right from the start. Yeah. I remember when they wore that dress. She just wore that dress not too long ago. Not a button the back of it so I could Get her pajamas on. She's like, no, Daddy, button. I got button. I got button. And Bella loves those spaghetti strap dresses. She likes long dresses. She was a girly girl. Always. She, she was just like, she went, I always like to put her in a Supergirl t shirt and she loved it. Every time. She always be smiling though. Bella, you have to like really kind of like you want some gum. <laughs> she, she, she said you want some gum. She was been looking in this picture. I think she's always just smiling at the camera. Chris asking if they're going to find them is strictly an attempt to make himself appear deeply affected by what has happened. In Chris's mind, what he just did was an Academy Award-winning performance. He believes he seemed so sad and heartbroken over his children that there would be no way for the interviewer to think that he could have possibly hurt them. But again, he was entirely emotionless. He was more monotone than I am in these videos. His behavior stands out even amongst other people who murder their family members, because in most cases, they still feel deeply towards their victims, but Chris feels nothing at all towards his wife and kids. I gotta find him. I gotta find your man. This the picture somebody sent me. Or it was side by side of Balance left in the man. That was opposed to like one of the news companies. Okay. This was the picture they use of the girls. Alright. Were you thinking about anything while I step down? There's not much I want to see these, these two girls and 
my wife again. So I wanted to come home. Children go missing in the FBI. It's a lot like you see in the movies. Okay. We like to get every single one of our recent resources. We like to call every agent and wake them up out of bed. Call them back from vacation. We just really like to put a full force in. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you're comfortable supporting? Yeah. Okay. That means that I want to have as many eyes, as many hands, as many investigators, as many evidence people as we can possibly get looking at your house. Okay. Can we do that right this minute? If you want to. Okay. I'll stay out of the way if you want. Okay. Um, that's usually best. For you, for us, yeah. for everyone. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to go stay at my friend's house then? Um, is that an option? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm not sure if it's still outside. Okay. I'm not sure or not. Cause All right. I don't have my phone. Oh. <laughs> I forgot to ask you about your phone. Yeah. So I don't have much to say. I have to here anyways. Okay. But, um, yeah. concrete block. So, what I might do then is in, I don't know, five, ten minutes, I might just step out for a very quick break and just say, guys, let's go in that house right now. Um, 2385. You did tell me that, and I did write it. The garage is 2385? The front door. The front door, 2385, and it, that latch or whatever is not going to get in our way? It, okay. uh, it should be unlatched. Okay, good. All right. If um, it is, just call me. Now, when they go in there, I want them to run a black light over everything. I want them to have to collect DNA, I want them to look for hair strands and DNA samples, and I want them to look at your stuff and your wife's stuff and your children's stuff and the garage stuff and the car stuff, all of it. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Do you have any problems with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so then I want them to do that sooner than later. I might step out here in a minute and just tell them the code and just let them know, guys, let's find how we can get these girls. Okay. Um, can we keep talking about some complicated things? Sure. Some things that are going to make you uncomfortable? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, and I think you know why I have to ask them. Yeah. Okay. And it's a hard job. It's a hard job. It is a hard job. And I'm going to ask you one thing and you're going to give me an answer and I'm going to ask it just a slight bit, bit different and you're going to give me an answer and then about ten iterations of this you might get annoyed but I do that to make sure that we understand each other. Okay, is that all right? Yeah. Okay. The interviewer is once again diffusing some of the tension that Chris is feeling and trying to get him to be a bit more comfortable, although not to the degree that he was at the beginning of this interview. He's about to ask Chris to repeat things he had already told him because he already knows Chris has been lying to him. So many of the things he has said in this interview alone does not match what Officer Coonrod, Nicole, and the investigation has proven happened. He's looking for Chris to change his story even more, add new supplemental details to the story that can be used to prove that Chris is lying. But if you were in a high-stress environment with someone who was asking you the same question over and over, that would be endlessly frustrating. You would realize that they aren't believing you, and you would likely choose to leave. So the interviewer negates that, stating it's just part of proper procedure and nothing to worry about exactly. Um, so... We have your daughter's who are missing. We have your wife's who's missing, okay? And that's the most important thing right now, okay? Um, do you agree with that? Yes. Okay. So you've done very good in talking to me about this really hard conversation you guys had, okay? Very good. That's sometimes hard. And I understand why sometimes someone in your position says, uh, doesn't want to tell me about that because please go help me find my kids and you don't need to know about my, my marriage argument, okay? So I gotta say, you've done very good at that um, and I need you to keep doing that. So I need to ask you about um, your marriage and uh, infidelity. Sure. Okay, tell me about it. Now, I have never cheated on my wife. That is a lie, and a pointless one at that. Chris seems to think that a simple hidden app on his phone won't be accessible to the FBI, like they are going to access his phone and see that a calculator app appears to have a large storage capacity and not question that. 
he also seems to think that even with all the media attention this case has gotten, that Nicole and everyone who knows about the relationship will keep quiet, which is an incredibly risky bet to make. More on that in a later video. Okay. And I fully suspect she has never done that to me. Oh, okay. Like, she's always been a trustworthy person. I've always been a trustworthy person. I fully expect if we ever thought about straying another way, mm -hmm. that we would tell each other before it happened. What he means to say is that he fully believes that if Shanann ever thought about straying another way, she would tell him that she was the type of person who would be honest and upfront about her emotions, unlike Chris, who, since meeting Nicole, had shut down emotionally and refused to speak to her about what was going on. Shanann was a very upfront and direct person. If she didn't like something or felt like something was wrong, she would draw attention to it in order to fix it. So the moment Chris started pulling away from the relationship, she brought it up and asked him what was wrong. He actively chose to hide what was going on from her and attempted to gaslight her into thinking that he was just stressed from work. I think that sounds ridiculous. Okay. Because in the history of the earth, nobody ever does that. Okay. I just, I just, I just, that's what I would like to think. Okay. I mean, I mean, I know mistakes happen. Like, sure. You know, yeah, but... That's what I, in my head, that's what I would okay. think would happen, I would hope would happen. Okay. But now, even though I think that sounds ridiculous, no. if I was in your shoes, I'd say the exact same thing. And, and I believe that. Okay. And, but I kind of don't. And you can imagine in my job, I meet all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine that there are people who have Saturdays with their girlfriends and Sundays with their wives. Okay. Right? And they consider themselves to be very virtuous people. Okay. So, with that in mind, I don't care if there's been anything in your relationship. I just don't. Uh -huh. And I'm not going to tell the news and I'm not going to tell anyone, but I do need to know. Uh -huh. So is there anyone that you think that maybe your wife got close with? The interview plays this extremely well, which isn't surprising. This whole interview has been extremely well done. He presses into Chris a bit, telling him what he said was absolute bullshit and that in his line of work, cheating is incredibly common. He emphasizes how cheating doesn't necessarily make someone a bad person, per se, and then ends his statement by asking if there is anyone that Shanann could have been seeing behind his back. The entire prelude before his question was meant to put Chris at ease for him cheating on his pregnant wife. He was subtly comforting Chris, giving him reason to think that yeah, there's nothing wrong with the fact that I spent the better part of a month sleeping with my coworker while fantasizing about getting rid of my family. He's beginning to think about coming forward, but instead of pressuring him directly to do so, he asks if his wife had been the one to step out. Absolutely brilliant play. If she did, it was very like secret then if that was the case, because okay. I, I had no inkling no at idea. all. No, okay. it, it wasn't even a sus suspicion. Okay, not one guy. Or girl. I'm, if, if, if that was the case, I mean, I didn't have one suspicion about it. Like, if, if, if it happened, it wasn't even, like, I wasn't aware. Nothing there was no clue. Right there was no, like, okay. you know, texting with the phone, like, back or, like, you know, I walk in, swipe type yeah. thing. I, I didn't really have any of that. Okay. No perfume when she's going out with the girls. She always smells. She always Break something you know what I mean? Yeah, like I know, but it perfume. wasn't it wasn't like you know like that one in a million perfume or something okay. like that. You know, all right. No late nights that surprised you. No. Okay. No, let's talk about you. Okay. Okay. Um, on your end, I gotta ask, what's your what's your name? <laughs> I don't have another one. You sure? I'm sure. Okay. Would you tell me if you did? Yes. Okay. Um. So, again, highly trained investigator over here, right? I see pictures of you from a few years ago, mm -hmm. and I see you standing before me now. Okay, okay. okay. you've gotten pretty fit. Yeah. Okay. You can imagine when guys start cheating or want to cheat, that's what happens. Yes. So tell me about it. So I did not cheat on my wife. Yes, he did. Again, lying about this is truly pointless, and it only goes to show how idiotic Chris actually is. He thinks by just repeating that he didn't cheat on his wife, that the FBI will not find any evidence of him cheating. Less than an hour earlier, he gave them his phone and gave them permission to look through it. He barely hid the evidence of his cheating, but he believes they simply won't know where to look. Chris had gone out publicly with Nicole. They had gone on multiple dates. 
and even if she never came forward herself, there were witnesses to his infidelity, but he believes that if he continues to repeat that he wouldn't do that, that will counteract any evidence that comes forward. By continuing to lie about this fact, he only makes himself look guiltier, though the public would certainly still suspect he had something to do with his family's disappearance had he come forward and said, yeah, I was leaving my wife because I had fallen in love with another person and I was cheating on her, he would at least be viewed by investigators as having nothing to hide. But continuing to spout his obvious lie, he just makes himself appear less trustworthy and gives the interview more ammunition. Okay. Not thrive, help me. I went from 245 pounds to about 245 pounds. And I'm great, man. Thank you. And I'm 185, 180 right now. Mm-hmm. And I've been eating cleaner, just trying to, the last, last little bit. Thrive has helped me a lot, but to maintain it and try to eat cleaner has really helped me as well. Okay. And I've got to imagine that maybe there was a girl that inspired that? No. No? No. Okay. Why are you falling out of love? After the last five, the last five weeks, like being by myself and being able to be myself again, I couldn't be myself around you anymore. Why not? It was like I was walking, just like, if, like you know, like walk on eggshells type thing. It's kind of like you don't, you feel like you're always doing something that's wrong. It's like you, you feel like you're never like. Doesn't make does that make sense at all? The timing doesn't make sense to me. In the span of five weeks, Chris decided not only that he didn't want to be with Shanann, but he didn't want to be a dad, and all it took was having a new girlfriend and being left on his own without any responsibilities. Shanann had taken the kids on a family trip, leaving him on his own for the first time since the kids had been born, and instead of missing his family, he felt free. He felt like he could go anywhere that he wanted to, and not be beholden to someone else's schedule. He tries to frame being responsible for his wife and kids as being bullied and picked on. He had walked on eggshells around Shanann, and couldn't functionally be himself. Not like he could with his cool new girlfriend, who would go to the car museum with him. Shanann, Bella, Celeste, and Nico required Chris to think outside of himself and not always put himself first. They needed him and expected him to do certain things for them as their husband and father, but Nicole didn't, so he liked her better. He wanted to be with the person who didn't expect him to act like a husband or a father, because it was less stressful and he didn't want to try with Shanann anymore. When Shanann realized they had stopped communicating and that he was pulling away from her, she apologized for her abrasive and controlling behavior, telling him that she knew it could make him feel negatively about himself and she would try to work on it. But he was already done, and it wasn't enough to divorce her. He wanted her and the kids to no longer exist. That way, he could have all the fun that he wanted with his new girlfriend. Okay, but like, it's like, like if you can't be yourself around your wife, who can you be yourself around? Why couldn't you be yourself around your wife? I just felt like... I'd always have to change who I was because I, I was always about, I mean, I was doing the laundry, I do, do everything. Mm-hmm. Like, I do everything that I could for her, everything. Mm-hmm. And then, like, the last five weeks, I was just like, I was just, you know, just being myself, just doing me. And I just thought to myself, like, one of my buddies, Mark, he lives out in San Diego, it was like one big test that he learned, like, he, he was divorced at one point. And he was like, so if you could picture yourself, like, if you could picture your wife, and she was with someone else, would you get jealous? I was like, at this point I have to say no. And he was like, well, there's your answer. Like, if you love her, it would be a different answer. The best example that Chris could provide of how much he did for Shanann was that he did the laundry for her. This is a man who was trying to defend his reasoning about why he would have to leave his missing wife, who happened to be two months pregnant, to the FBI. And all he can say was he did so much for her because she had him do their laundry. That is not an unreasonable ask, and if you think that it is, then you either hate doing laundry too much, or you're extremely out of touch. Had Shanann been too demanding of him, forced him to do things he didn't want to do, or forced him into uncomfortable situations, he would have been able to provide real, tangible examples. But the reality is that being a partner and a parent is hard. Sometimes it takes compromise, and I'm willing to bet that Shanann also did the fucking laundry. When trying to defend his actions to someone who Chris believes is the most important person to get on his side, all he can say is that she asked him to help out around the home, and he believes that's reason enough to leave the marriage when she is newly pregnant. When did you start pulling out? 
it, ha it, it wasn't in the last five weeks. It's been an ongoing process for probably about a year. Why? I just felt like everything that we had when we first started dating and met, like we met in 2010, everything, you know, your new relationship, spark, everything hot, have everything's great. Get married, everything's still great. And then like, you know, people just fall out of love. And that's, that's where I was. Like, I just felt like over the last year, I thought that like, okay, maybe, maybe this is just like a phase. Maybe it's, you know, like just, you know, this is what happened. Like you've been with somebody so long. Maybe like, you know, the spark into there just reunited somehow, some way. But, you know, our conversations weren't the same. Like when we were apart, like everything was just like, you know, short and it was just like, it, nothing felt right anymore. The disconnection was there and it just never felt right anymore. He's explaining this in an incredibly passive way as the problem in the relationship was that both parties had checked out. But Shanann was still very much in the relationship. As far as she believed, prior to their vacation, things were more or less fine. They were having sex, taking care of the kids, and communicating the way they always had. When he did begin to distance himself from her, she immediately tried to remedy the situation, and was even more open with him. Their communication was off because of him. But he tries to frame it as something he wasn't actively choosing to do. But why? better like I just didn't feel it like it was like I didn't have that passion anymore why not I, I, I really couldn't I can't tell you like it, the passion I, I didn't feel it in my heart anymore like, I really I really can't like just give you a definitive answer other than that just like my heart wasn't in it I gotta tell you, that sounds like a load of horseshit, uh, man. Um, I know. What about the girls? Bella and Celeste are of my life. I'd do anything for those girls. I'd step in front of a bullet so I'd put a train for those girls. It doesn't add up to me, then why did this part back? The breadth of the relationship between me and Shanann has nothing to do with the love I have for these girls. I mean, the love for these girls, these, I mean, they're the light of my life. I would do anything for them. Mm -hmm. But me and Shannon talked about, like, if we separated or if we stay together, like, what's best for the kids? Like, do we stay together for the kids? That, you look it up, it doesn't work that way. Like, it might cause more issues for the kids later on down the road with their psyche or personality or something. They know when they can, they get older, they see, like, oh, Mom and dad don't sleep in the same room anymore, like what's going on, type thing. Okay. Chris didn't even try to make things work with Shanann, making his statements that staying together would have hurt the girls falls short. There's a chance the two could have gotten on the same page. If he stopped cheating, they went to therapy, and they both relearned how to communicate effectively, their relationship could have thrived. But instead, he killed her and the kids and tried to frame her for it. If you had to guess, if you had to put your finger on it, if you had to, you know, why do two people that are hot and heavy that have kids that they love, what happens? I mean, you can't take the kids into the fact into the factor because, like, when the love you have for your kids is going to be like exponential. I mean, it, it'll no matter what, that will never die because mm -hmm. those are your kids. Mm -hmm. That'll never die. Between you and your wife, like, the love that you have for each other, like, from start to finish, like, from right when you started to where you're in your, if your relationship ends, like, some like. When you're in that type of relationship, you're with somebody for that long, something happens. Like, something like, if it's just conversations or if it's just like, you know, I mean, it's not attractiveness at all. Like, it's just a connection that isn't there. Like, you know, when you can, like, look at someone and, or just, like, put your forehead to their forehead and you just, like, hold them and you know what each other's thinking. That's a connection. I didn't have that connection anymore. I do to help you walk out of this room and not look like the person who's responsible? You have to trust me that when I tell you that these two beautiful girls right here 
I did nothing to them and to my beautiful wife. I did nothing to her. Like, you have to trust me and believe me. Like, I know you don't know me as a person. You, you've known me for like two and a half, three hours. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what your opinion is. But you have to realize that these two beautiful girls right here and my wife, I had nothing to do with the disappearance. Like, they vanished. They were taken. Someone take, has taken them. They're safe somewhere. We don't know. I had nothing to do with these with this act of like evil cruelty whatever has happened here because my love for these two girls and my wife like I don't want anything to happen to them I've never wanted anything to happen to them no matter if me and my wife separate or not or divorce or anything I never wish harm on anybody on a human being in general okay. like just seeing that picture like I need them, I, I want them just to run through that front door and just grab me, mm -hmm. or just barrel, just tackle me, knock me to the floor, bust my head up, I don't care. Chris has been practicing what statements he would give, and this was definitely one of them. He has said it in every media interview and most of the conversations he has had with law enforcement. But just because you repeat that you want your children to run into your arms and tackle you because you miss them so much doesn't make it true. Again, he has been nearly emotionless this entire interview. He appeared almost bored, and when he looked at the picture of the woman and children he killed, he had no reaction to it. Once again, he tells the officer that he simply has to trust him and that he wouldn't do anything to hurt his family, because he just isn't that kind of a guy. The same way he is not the type of guy who would cheat on his wife or get in shape to try and step out of the marriage. Sure, the issue is that trusting him means to put aside all the other evidence. They would have to overlook the fact that after Chris left in the morning, the only way out of the home that he hadn't locked from the inside was through the garage, which only he had a way to access. You would have to ignore that he pulled his truck into the garage, which he had never done before, and appeared to load it up before leaving. And you would have to ignore the fact that the entire time his family has been missing, he hasn't shed one tear. Trusting Chris means not trusting the direct evidence of his guilt, and most reasonable people would not do that. Moreover, no FBI investigator would do that either. The amount of love I have for my family is exponential, and I, it's never going to die. And they need, I want them back. Okay. I have to have them back. Chris is about to describe an average day in his life, prior to Shanann, Bella, and Celeste going missing. Before we begin, let's remember one of the reasons he fell out of love with Shanann was because she was so demanding, and one of the main reasons his children are missing is because he no longer wanted the responsibility of being a father. So let's hear about how demanding being the man of the Watts house was. So, well, I'm usually at work. Okay. But, so usually on their lives and your lives. Okay. So school, or school day. So I'll get up about four o'clock. I'll go down, work out for maybe about an hour or so. At your house? Yeah, it's a, a weight bench in the basement. Okay. So get down with that, come back upstairs by about five o'clock. I'll eat some breakfast, make some eggs, cottage cheese, something like that. Everybody's still sleeping. I'll make the girls milk. I'll make Cece's milk. I'll bring it upstairs. Bella's usually kind of iffy on milk in the morning, so I just okay. fill up the water bottles, mm -hmm. put it in the refrigerator, make sure the backpacks have change clothes, their hat, and if it's like a swim, like a water day or something, make sure they have water shoes in there, make sure they have sunscreen, make sure all that in their backpacks. Change clothes for what? In case they have an accident. Like, oh, okay. Because they're little. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And not much Bella, but Celeste. Sure. Um, and make sure they have their little blankies if they, whenever they go nap. Okay. They have all that with them. I have that all laid out, and then I go to work. Mm -hmm. So, well, the kids dictate when Shanann wakes up, and usually, usually it's Bella. She'll come in there, lay in the bed with her. And then Celeste, she'll wake up, and she'll come in and lay in the bed with her, and they'll watch cartoons for, for a little while at least. Mm -hmm. And probably about 6.30, they'll get out, they'll... Shannon will, well, she'll probably be in the bathroom at this point in time while they're watching because she 
Celeste has her milk at that point in time and she's just chilling in the bed. Okay. Samantha's getting ready, she'd probably take a shower, put makeup on, all that kind of stuff, and then takes the kids over into their rooms, gets them dressed, out of pajamas, and their Bella, Bella has a school uniform. CC didn't have one yet, so okay. um, get them dressed. Um, to be clear, that is Shanann taking the kids back into their room and getting them dressed, not Chris. Go downstairs, have breakfast. CC will probably have cereal. Bella probably have, uh, some like cinnamon toast. Mm-hmm. Um, have that. They may have, might have a little snack on the way to school. Maybe some dry cereal or something. Okay. Shanann put them in the cars and go to school. Mm-hmm. And then they'll stay at school usually to about. 4 o'clock, 4.30. I'll usually be home by then. I can go pick them up. I go in there, sign them out, get them in the car, drive back. They'll be screaming the whole way because they want mommy. Mm-hmm. And that's what they do after a long day of school. Mm-hmm. And I get home. Shannon sure will have something for the girls, being whatever they want. Either it might be pizza. Sometimes they want french fries. Sometimes they want chicken nuggets. Sometimes kibbasi. Just like, just whatever. Most of them, they have butter noodles. They love that. Okay. So, so them at the, wash their hands, sit them at the table, and they'll eat their dinner. And then usually go upstairs, take a shower with them, get them all washed up, get them dry out, get some lotion, get their pajamas on, back downstairs, have a little nighttime snack, go pick it, you know, cheese it, the okay. wafers, or something like that. And they'll sit in their little couches and they'll watch a cartoon until about 7 o'clock. And then between 6, 30, and 7, we're giving them the medicine and any medicine they need at that point in time, if one of them has fever or okay. whatever else. And then brush their teeth. Upstairs, CC gets an overnight diaper. Bella doesn't, and read my book. CC usually wants a uh, tiger, the tiger book, mm-hmm. and I read that to her. We growl out the last part, mm-hmm. turn the rain machines on. Put is, the is that what you said? She's your tiger. Yes. Is that coming by? Yes. Okay. And turn the rain machines on. Give them both kids good night. CC wants me to put her to bed. Bella wants to put her to bed, and close the door. And night night. So that was an average day which Chris was so burdened by that he murdered them. Notice how, at no point in that description of his day, had Shanann or the girls demanded too much of him. Each parent played an equal role, and they both worked together to keep the girls happy and healthy. But again, that was way too much for Chris. So let's have that hard conversation again. Okay. How old are they? Four and three. That would be five in December. Okay. You can imagine that every day that goes by gets harder to find. Where we don't find your girls. It's going to get harder to find. We're going to have less clues. Things that we need to get and we need to use. The methods that we need to do to find them are going to start getting blown away by weather. Getting re-recorded over themselves at the surveillance store that's going to tell us. All of that is going to disappear. Okay, And that's why we're going to spend so much time today, tomorrow, as, as in the front as we can. Right? You can also imagine that every day that goes by, we're going to be looking for the man who did this. Okay? And you can imagine that we're going to inc- include you as that man. Yeah. So, let's talk about that. I think that you're trying to put on a great face because you're a man and you're a father and you're a husband. I can tell that there's just something you're not telling me. And I'm not sure what it is. I don't know why that is. I don't know why you're not telling me, but there's something that's making you a little bit uncomfortable tonight. I just don't believe some of the things you're telling me. Okay, I just don't. I simply do not believe you. What makes you think? What have I said that makes you not believe me at all? 
This is possibly the worst thing the interview could have said to Chris, in that it was what Chris was most afraid of. At the beginning of this interview, hours earlier, Chris believed the two had a nice bond. He thought they were on their way to becoming some sort of friends, and he talked to him openly. The interviewer validated him throughout, agreeing with him at times, even when what Chris was saying was frankly unbelievable and stupid. And it was only in the last 30 minutes or so that he actually began to call Chris out on some of his more outlandish claims. But he still managed to do it in a way that made Chris feel like he had a chance of getting him back on his side. So when the interviewer tells Chris directly that he doesn't believe him, Chris has begun to panic. He thought the entire time he had this man on the hook, and he is now actually questioning him about what exactly it is that he doesn't believe. He said so much in these two hours that he actually cannot recall what he has said that would be viewed as unbelievable. This just doesn't make sense to me, it doesn't add up. So can we talk about two Chris's? Can two Chris's? The tale of two Chris's? Can it? Um, and you need to help me know which Chris I'm looking at today and which Chris you really are. So, Chris number one is right here, right? And fell out of love with his wife, okay? Started wondering what it might be. He didn't have a wife to take care of and a girl to take care of. Spent some time alone, liked that time alone, came home, may or may not have had a conversation about how to get out of this marriage or how to fix it, but probably how to get out of it. Is looking at a bachelor pad in Brighton and did something terrible to his wife and kids. And that may have been an accident. And I think it was an accident. And that's exactly what happened. Chris believed he was outmaneuvering the investigation the entire time. He believed that through his words alone, he would be able to get away with murder. And within 24 hours, this investigator sitting across from him, describing exactly what it was he did to his wife and children. However, he tells Chris that he believes that whatever happened to his wife and kids, it was likely an accident, which means he's employing the Reed Technique. According to the Encyclopedia of Applied Psychology, the Reed Technique is an accusatory process in which the investigator tells the suspect, in this case, Chris, that he clearly committed the crime in question. It's a multi-purpose process, starting with the interrogator establishing the facts of the situation one-on-one -on -one with Chris. This accounts for the first section of the interview, in which Chris was asked to recount exactly what happened the morning his family went missing. The second phase is a behavioral analysis, which takes place at the same time. This analysis allows the interrogator to get a read on the suspect. The goal is to gain their trust and get them to let their guard down when talking about what had occurred. The next step is actually nine steps, which we will read directly from the 2004 edition of the Encyclopedia of Applied Psychology. Number one, direct confrontation. Advise the suspect that the evidence has led the police to the individual as a suspect. Offer the person an early opportunity to explain why the offense took place. This is what is currently occurring at this point in the interview. The interrogator is telling Chris that the investigation is pointing towards Chris, and he doesn't believe that he didn't hurt his wife and kids. Simultaneously, the interrogator has progressed to step two. Try to shift the blame away from the suspect to some other person or set of circumstances that prompted the suspect to commit the crime. That is, develop themes containing reasons that will psychologically justify or excuse the crime. Themes may be developed or changed to find one to which the accused is most responsive. So when the interviewer states that he believes that whatever happened to Shanann and the girls had to have been an accident, he is blaming the circumstances that led to their murder. Something must have happened to force his hand, to make him hurt the girls, because he's such a good guy. While we haven't gotten to the other steps used in the read technique, let me simply list them now, again, using the excerpt we read before. Number three, try to minimize the frequency of suspect denials. Number four, at this point the accused will often give a reason why he or she did not or could not commit the crime. Try to use this to move toward the acknowledgement of what they did. Number five, reinforce sincerity to ensure that the suspect is receptive. Number six, the suspect will become quieter and listen. Move the theme of the discussion toward offering alternatives. If the suspect cries at this point, infer guilt. 
Number seven, pose the alternative question, giving two choices for what happened, one more socially acceptable than the other. The suspect is expected to choose the easier option, but whichever alternative the suspect chooses, guilt is admitted. As stated earlier, there is always a third option that is to maintain that they did not commit the crime. Number eight, lead the suspect to repeat the admission of guilt in front of witnesses and develop corroborating information to establish the validity of the confession. And number nine, document the suspect's admission or confession and have him or her prepare a recorded statement, audio, video, or written. Let's watch and note if these steps come to pass. That's not the Chris you're looking at right now. Chris has just been directly accused of murdering his pregnant wife and child, and the best response he can give is another bland, unconvincing statement that that is not the kind of person he is. Imagine if your family member was missing, and you were being accused of having something to do with it. You've spent the entire day searching, worrying about their health and if they are safe, and someone who was supposed to be looking for them tells you, to your face, that they think you did it. You would be furious. You would think that they were wasting your time and not doing their job. You'll likely leave, tell them to fuck off, and storm out. But Chris is quiet, just responding that he wouldn't kill them. The only Chris you're looking at is the man who loves these kids and loves his wife and will never, ever, ever do anything to harm them. That's the Chris you're looking at right now. The Chris you're looking at right now wants these kids and his wife back at his house right now. That's the Chris you're looking at. Why didn't you call 911? I didn't think anything was wrong. I think you knew what was wrong. I did not know what was wrong, sir. I promise you that. What do you think it's going to look like? someone finds out that it was not you that called 911. Everybody's going to have their own perception about what's going on here, but I know my wife. I know that sometimes she doesn't text me back. I know that happens. I've, I've, I've been there. It's happened multiple times throughout many days. If she's busy with work, it doesn't happen. That's why it didn't register for me that day. We're back to his tale of two Christmas Chris. Okay. There's a Chris who cares. Um, I care. I promise. Chris, saying he cares about finding his wife and kids while smiling and laughing is telling. He could not care any less than he does. And the only thing he cannot do less is act. Tell me about the call to your daycare. To the primrose? I called them to see if the girls were there. He said they weren't there. Okay. I told them since they weren't there, just put them back on the waiting list. That's not what you told me. I told them that we were going to sell the house. Or we could put it on the market, or probably won't be in the area anymore. That's two different things, Chris. Well, I wanted them to be back on, on I put them on the, on the waiting list since they weren't there. Why weren't they there? I don't know. Where were they going to go? They went to a, Snan took them to a friend's house. Why wouldn't they go to daycare? I am not sure. Uh, honestly, sir, I am not sure. He can't even explain his own actions. This is probably the most damning piece of circumstantial evidence to come out of this case. Because even the people who have defended Chris have a difficult time justifying him disenrolling Bella and Celeste after murdering them. He tries to argue that he did it because the girls weren't home because Shanann took them, even though he disenrolled them before they were reported missing and before he claimed in this interview that he began taking the case seriously. When that is pointed out, he changes his reasoning to being that because they were going to move post-separation. But the damage is already done. It's hard for me as a father to talk to you about this. Uh -huh. Not because it's the hardest you to talk about. I'm worried about your daughters under your care. You shouldn't have to worry about them under my care. Okay. I watched them all weekend. I went to went to a pool party, went to a pool party at Jeremy Lindstrom's house. 
like, I love those kids with all my heart. And nothing in this world would ever make me do anything to these kids or my wife. Great argument, Chris. He basically said that because he didn't kill his kids before now, he most definitely didn't do it. It's almost comical how fucking stupid that is. When you walk out of this room, there's nothing I can say to a room full of police officers that's going to convince them that you have nothing to do with this. I know. You know what they think. I, I know it all. all it, yeah. Here's a guy who didn't call 911, who woke his wife up at a ridiculous hour because he was so guilty about something that he had to get it off his chest and say, I don't love you anymore, I'm leaving you. That didn't go well. Okay, so what happened? She told me she wanted me to wake her up before I left. That's why I didn't just wake her up, like, just to tell her this. Like, I woke her up. That's what she wanted to do, and we talked. Like, usually at 4 a.m., I wake up, I go down and work out. I wanted to talk to her about this. I love these girls. I love these girls so much. And this picture right here, Celeste and Bella, those are my life. I helped make those kids. There's nothing in my life that means more to me than these kids. Nothing. Kids, that's, that's your life. That's your lifeline. That's everything. Like, you make kids, they come first before anything. Kids, spouse, family. That's what it's always been. Nothing you've told me tonight makes sense. Nothing you've told me tonight feels like the truth. Can we start over? Sure. I think that There's something that happened that got maybe a little bit out of control. There was no fight. There was nothing physical. It was a mo it was a conversation. There was there's no we didn't raise our voice. Nothing. I promised you that. So there was there was nothing physical with this conversation. What was the last thing? What was the last thing you saw about your daughters? Nothing I saw, like when I left. What did it look like? I saw them in the monitor as it was switching back and forth. What's the last thing you saw with your wife? As she was laying back in bed as I was walking out the door, walking out the bedroom door. Okay. This is a common psychological test that many people have used to ascertain if the person they are speaking to is guilty or not. But because this test is so common, the majority of people know exactly how to answer this question like an innocent person. Basically, the principle is that if you don't know who committed the crime, separate each suspect and ask them what they think should happen to the person responsible. An innocent person would likely tell the person asking that they should arrest them, put them in jail, punish them for committing the crime, and not coming forward. But a guilty party would imply the person might be deserving of leniency and downplay their actions. Again, this is not a tried and true measure of someone's guilt, and we've seen some people claim as much, including Dr. Phil. But let's see how Chris responds. Honestly, like, they're going to come home safe, correct? When you find the guy. When we find the guy, they're going to come home. 
life in prison would be the that's what I would that's what I would think with two kids that are involved. Chris can't even pass the small test. He can't even confidently say the fictional person who kidnapped his kids should be in prison. He sounds tepid, like he isn't quite sure if kidnapping and holding his daughters and wife against their will is really a punishable offense. He could not have answered this question worse if he tried. What if he hurt them? Did they thought, did, did, I'm not sure if like, that penalty is even used, is it used in Colorado? I'm not even sure what is the death penalty. Okay. Um, I mean, like, if these kids are not alive, like, there's no, there's nothing you could do to, to cope with that, to make me cope with that, if those kids are not okay. Well, he certainly sold that. He definitely comes across as being deeply emotionally invested in his children's well-being. I am, of course, being sarcastic. Chris genuinely believes that he had the majority of the police force, Shanann's friends, and family on his side, and that there might be one or two people who didn't believe him, but nothing too significant. And his change in tone when he is told that everyone believes he is involved is significant. Even though they are about to break for the night, Chris will likely not be able to rest. He's going to be going over everything he has said and done, wondering what it was that he did to make them think he was guilty, and thinking up new excuses as to why he did those things. Have you ever watched the news and said two girls and a pregnant woman go missing? Okay, if that's all you heard, what do you think the public thinks? Husband. Husband. Okay. So, I'm going to make a commitment to you. Okay. I'm going to commit to you that I'm going to be your guy. Okay. I'm going to be your guy that handles the investigation. Okay. And I'm going to be your guy that you can come to. Okay. Because. I hope that you realize I'm, I'm a nice guy. Um, tonight we had to talk about some tough things, but I hope that you know that I did it respectfully. I think that you can see that. Um, and so as we go on through tonight, the hours, the days, and I hope we don't get to hours or days. I hope it's minutes, right, until this is over. Yes. But just in case it's not, I want you to know that I wanted to be in this room tonight. I wanted to talk to you. Okay. Okay. And I hope that you want to talk to me. Okay. When you have questions, when you have concerns, I want you to call uh, the detective that you work with, and I want you to call me. Okay. I want you to know that if you have a question, if you think we're not doing something enough or well enough, I want you to say, "I gotta call Graham. I gotta call Dave." Okay. Okay. When you need to 
to have a night to yell at somebody and maybe have a good cry, I want you to call me. Sure. Okay. I can't imagine what you're going through. I just can't. Right, well, as today has been the whirlwind from like yesterday, I thought she was just at somebody's house, and today with the drones, the police, and the news. I, I look like a scene out of a, a scene out of a movie. That's too much. It's too much for one person to handle. My dad's flying in tomorrow. Good. Okay. Check so your dad who else? Yeah. Uh, Nick and Amanda, Dave, Jeremy. Okay. Yeah, you only know me for three hours, but I want to be part of that team. Okay. Okay. I want to be part of the team that helps you, and I want you to be part of my team. Okay. Okay. Tonight when you go home. One of two things is going to happen. You're going to pass out because you're so tired. Okay, and that's probably not going to be what happens. Your head's going to go race. Okay, so tonight when you lay down and your head starts racing, there's going to be things that come to your mind. Okay, this always happens. Always, it's very natural. You're going to say, "I wonder why he asked me that." Okay, you're going to say, "Screw him! How dare he accuse me?" Okay, you're going to say, "I wonder if they thought of this." Okay, and then you're going to say. I probably should have told him something, or this, or that, okay? Those are the most common things. Huh. Um, when those thoughts come to your head, I want you to call me. Okay. I want you to call Dave, okay? Um, it's fair for your mind to race, so I want you to call me, okay? You need a lifeline. You need someone you can call. I want to be that guy, all right? Um, and I want you to know that if I didn't accuse you a little bit, you'd probably wonder if I was good at my job. Uh, one, right. of my, one of my buddies, he, he is straight with me. He was like, dude, I'll just be I'm no veil. Like, none of this looks good. So right. it's like, he's like, I'm not going to accuse anybody, but like, I'm not going to be like, he has his wife and their friends. It's like, they won't talk to you right now. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I don't know. So we had this Chris, right? Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the other Chris. He's just right here, okay? I can see that you're a good man, right? You don't have beautiful daughters with good clothing that look well fed, right? Children that are unhappy don't smile like this, okay? And those are beautiful kids. Those kids have a good dad, and I know it. I just see the picture it's on my phone. Yeah. It's a better one. But it's just I'm sorry too. But it's Those kids have a good dad. Good dad that feeds them and that loves them. I was very impressed when I asked you how their day was about how involved you are. Okay. Yeah, see this on the on the weekend. A lot of dads don't get second pairs of clothes and cook eggs and give them snacks at night, you know, a lot of, a lot of men, that's woman's work, right? I uh, like to get involved. But you're not that kind of guy, okay? So, Chris, can you just look at me for one second? If there is something that happens, it's okay. It really is, yeah. okay? If something that happened with these girls, if there was an accident, if there is something you're afraid to tell me, it's okay. Yeah. If there's something that happened with your wife, it's okay. Okay? You can always tell me. And if you want to talk 15 minutes after you leave, I'll answer the phone. If you want to talk in the middle of the morning, I'll answer the phone. Okay? What I want to happen is, if that's what happened, if there was something that got out of hand, if there's something you know, I want you to go home and I want you to know that I'm the guy you can talk to, okay, who's not going to judge you. I have kids. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I sometimes I joke with my wife, I just need two weeks alone, you know? Like when you told me about your four to five weeks alone, I was like, wow, that sounds like a slice of heaven, right? Obviously, it matters if he killed Shanann and the girls, but the interrogator has ramped up the pressure before the interview has ended. He has caused Chris to question everything, and even though Chris is leaving, it's doubtful he will have a restful night.
he is downplaying what will happen if Chris confesses to what he has done, because as Chris continues to panic about trying to appear innocent, his confession could look like the best path forward. The rest of the footage is rather uneventful, but again, a link to an unedited upload will be left below. Chris's interrogation had gone poorly, but he hadn't confessed to what he had done. The next day, he was set to come into the police station for another interview and polygraph test. He had no idea that this was his last night on earth as a free man.